I was looking on Instagram. I don't remember what I was looking at. And I saw you post a picture. I think I messaged you a few days ago or something. And it's funny that you messaged me back when you did like my kid. Um, and we, we can not start this as the podcast beginning, but my kid w- was wanting to watch generation kill. And we just finished it last night. We've been watching over the last few weeks. And I happened to see you in a picture with Rudy Reyes on Instagram at shot. And I was like, I looked at your profile or something. I was like, Oh, I'll hit this dude up and see, you know, like that'd be a cool interview. Like, you know, because you've obviously done a lot of stuff beyond just that, but I thought just funny timing, how it all works out, you know? Yeah, that's cool, man. That's cool. What'd you guys think of the show? Um, I liked it. You know, it came out. I, so I was in from 2006 to 2018. Um, it came out nice. around the time I was like a corporal or sergeant and nice. I was like, oh yeah. Like, you know, everyone was like, yeah, listen to, you know, the conversations are funny. Like, it's like, yeah. it's not like some like war movies where it's just like combat constantly. You know, it's the reality of like, there's a lot of boredom. There's a lot of downtime. There's a lot of bullshit. Um, I thought that, we that, thought that was good. Yeah. The, the, under the staff level of, uh, of the inner team dialogue and most importantly talking shit. So, yeah, for sure. Because I think a lot of movies focus on like the officers and the commands and stuff doing, you know what they're doing when the reality is like, there's so much funny stuff that happens in all kinds of situations, you know? Um, (laughs) and I thought it captured that really well. I thought it was funny. I don't know if you remember this or not, but the Sergeant major of the Marine Corps and the commandant at the time, um, were like, this is not representative of the Marines we watched like 10 minutes. We had to turn it off, you know, and I think it was the scene where they were passing around that, that girl's photo. And they're like, Oh, you know, eat a mile of shit to figure out where that came from or something like that. Oh, so, so the commandant and the, the, the smadge actually said that. Yeah. They did not approve of how it represented Marines. I was like, dude, I thought it was awesome. I thought it was Fucking funny. Pussies, dude. Yeah. <laughs> what <are> you- <laughs> yeah. What are you, I mean, what are your uh, thoughts on it? You know, that it's a representation of something you actually did. So was it accurate? You think? You know, I've never watched it, man. Uh, really? None of it? No, no. Uh, I watched, I think, the first episode. So they had two premieres. Um, and the, one of those premieres uh, was in Hollywood, obviously. And Eric Cucker, Jeff Carrizales, and Rudy, Rudy Reyes were there for that. I turned that one down. But the, uh, the one on base, the one on Pendleton, I actually went to. And uh, each one of us had, like, our, our respective – actors that portrayed us and that actor sat next to us we watched the screen so i I didn't sit next to kellen 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 lutz played me uh but he wasn't there for that but i gotta watch it and you know i've talked to a lot of people that have watched it and a lot of boys a lot of a lot of other marines and you know i I know uh, you know what it's about i mean (laughs) that was my that was my deployment from what i saw you know i saw the intro and i did see the the one episode where we got into a tick um, was portrayed a little differently, but um, where we took some pretty serious heavy contact and we started taking fire uh, really from the sides, but in the movie for that scene, it was direct at us up, mm-hmm. up above six, seven stories. There were some flashes. So, I mean, they did a pretty good job of like the intensity of that, um, you know, it was definitely differently different excuse me so i mean pretty surreal to be honest with you man uh trying to be humble about the thing uh you know i i'm 43 i grew up in the 80s and 90s watching hbo and here we are there's 23 of us in this platoon and you know here myself and my boys were on a seven part miniseries on hbo so it's a very surreal experience very wild very surreal experience did you did you watch war movies growing up or anything like that yeah, oh yeah, like all of them. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so all the classics, you know, and it's <laughs> yeah. funny. It's like now you're one of those people portrayed in one of those videos that people are going to watch for decades and be like, oh man, you know, like if I was to watch, if I was to bring up like Torah, Torah, Torah or something like that, or, you know, one of those old school ones, those are like events that actually happen. And I don't know, it's just crazy that you're, per, you know, you're portrayed in it and stuff like that. Does that feel weird that, to be like, obviously it's not you, but it's like it's supposed to be a portrayal of what you did you know? Yeah. You know, I mean, they used my name, I guess, first and foremost, I auditioned to play my own self, uh, as Jason Lilly to play Jason Lilly. And <laughs> I think I just show up and breathe and blink my eyes. And they're like, nah, uh, you're not good enough to play yourself. We're going to hire Kevin Lutz who played in twilight <laughs> to, pl- to play you. And I'm actually friends with him now. I got to hang out with him in LA a few times. And, uh, that's cool. 
He actually named his daughter after me. Her name is Lily, and he spells it just a little bit differently. Oh so, wow! How yeah, he's incredible. a good, he's a good human being, uh, fantastic husband and father, and he's got three, two or three brothers that are Marines as well. So, you know, he's he's a good dude, man. How so, much interaction did you guys have with like the production team to like? maybe just to sit down and tell stories and stuff so you get a vibe of everything or how much were you guys involved with it at all? Right. Uh, myself, not so much. Uh, however, you know, to answer directly that question, um, Kellen that played me, every one of the actors that portrayed the guys uh, called like on a sat phone from like Namibia because that's where they shot it. Mm-hmm. So uh, the, the actors would basically hang out with this, you know, over the phone and get a feel for us. So I talked to Kellen uh, for sure one time and maybe uh, two or three times after that. It's been a long time, but then you know, we broke out over the phone and he got a feel for me. And I know I talk very laid back, kind of stonerish. And, uh, <laughs> you know, being in San Diego like yourself, I, I've been, you know, surfing for almost 20 years. So I know I say bro a lot, but I've never said. <laughs> I've never said bra no. once. So nah. So I know they made me say bra a billion times and I disagree with that. But uh I mean, dude, I was twenty-three when that thing was portrayed. You know, all of us were really young, like most brains. So it's just super surreal, man. That's uh, so crazy. Was really crazy. I didn't get my own part. So <laughs> <laughs> you're <laughs> no. just not realistic enough to play the part. Uh, yeah, yeah, man. Uh still pretty funny you know i like to make fun of myself so it was still still a crazy experience did your hometown was it like a big deal in your hometown and stuff uh you know i don't know man i was so you know i've been gone from my hometown i'm from yeah. wichita wichita kansas just outside of a little town called rose hill is where i went to high school so yeah i mean i think some people watched it maybe years later realized it was me but that's funny yeah nothing crazy well, before all that, you know, you you didn't start out at recon, right? You uh, came in as a regular infantryman. What made you decide to join the Marine Corps? Uh, a good friend of mine, man, a neighbor in schoolmate by the name of uh, Adam Parks was the one uh, that brought it up. And he actually brought up being a recon Marine. It was the first time I even heard that title. And I think it was clear and present danger. And I remember the actor's face and they basically got penned down in the bush and, you know, they all got fucked up, which isn't a good portrayal of a reconnaissance team. But, you know, it was like the Marine version of the Navy SEALs to me is like a young guy, you know, deep behind enemy lines, a six man team, you know, operators that were fucking studs to me. So he was the first one to put that little yellow birdie in my ear, man, to be honest with you. So, uh he ended up not joining i started working out i started running and uh ended up joining man so that was i knew i wanted to be a fighter Uh, i knew i wanted to be an 03 so uh i was definitely half ass set on recon but i tell you what going to soi and just getting to the fleet i i wanted nothing to do with recon man i just wanted to be a normal grunt and just cut my teeth there and it was a fire hose to the fucking mouth the way it was. So some guys are recon babies that go right into it. Mm-hmm. Not, for, not for me. And I wouldn't change that for the world, man. The kind of what you and I talked about. Um, there is not the heartbeat of the Marine Corps is an 0311. That is the meat and potatoes. That is the fucking engine of the Marine Corps. So I don't care what MOS you are. 0311 is the fucking Marine Corps in my opinion. So and I, I cherish those times and those moments and those dudes that I stood next to, you know, is equal, if not more than the rest of my experience in life. For yeah, sure. Yeah, for sure. What year did you join? I joined in 2000. Uh, 2000, it's a, man. It's always interesting to talk to someone that joined right before 9-11, you know, because it's like, uh, yeah. at the time, it's like, well, join, maybe go see some places, get some college yeah. money. You know, <laughs> there was no war you know, on the it, front, you know, or what, what were your thoughts? Yeah, man, it wasn't, you know, I, I just, you know, Kansas is, is a very beautiful place and it's near and dear to my heart. You know, it's shaped my psyche in a lot of ways. And every state in our country is a beautiful place. I don't care where you're from. Every state, every city has something to offer. So don't ever talk smack on it. You know, we got a beautiful country and I'm hyper thankful that I grew up in Kansas. So but I wanted out, you know, like I wanted to jump out of the nest and 
growing up on National Geographic, man, like that was my ticket out, you know, and plus my grandpa fought in World War II, fought. He was a radio in first class during World War II in Korea on a destroyer escort uh, called the Crowder. And so that was always in my mind. He was the only other one that joined besides myself. Uh, and my uncle was the Air National Guard. So just mad respect for that generation and all the movies that we grew up on and G.I. Joe as a kid. And there was just something adventurous to check that box, man. It, it called me. You know, I wasn't like this hardcore fighter. You know, it just, uh, just kind of pulled me into it, man. It was almost fate. And going 0311 was was the option i had no other option in my mind besides that so i wanted to try it at least mm -hmm. and uh you know it was it was a crazy time man and then in boot camp you know i turned 21 in boot camp i couldn't wait two weeks and just uh, have a normal 21 21st birthday with a bunch of dudes and a bunch of ladies around now i wanted to get my my dick kicked in the in the sand and you know i couldn't time. wait to, couldn't wait to get in, man. It was time to time to join now. So, uh, yeah, dude. You know, SOI, and then getting orders to Lima Company Three Five, um, Fifth Marines, man. Famous famous Marines that actually took down uh, Fallujah in '04. Those were my boys under Sergeant Major Vines, a crazy guy. And uh, yeah, you know, I, I think it was not long. I think I'd been in the fleet maybe eight months, nine months when we had fallen out for formation and half of our platoon had fallen out under Perry Bishop. We're like, where the fuck is everyone on? And then you hear this voice from the barracks, you know, there at Camp San Mateo. I'm like, hey, everyone come in here real quick. And we all run in. And right when I broke the threshold of that door is when I watched the second plane whack the tower live. So it was a super surreal moment, man. It was uh, forever you know, etched in my mind and right away. I'm like, dude, we're fucking going to war. And, uh, I mean, they locked the base down. We broke out our gas mask. They gave us, I think a mag of live ammunition, you know, you know, you're basically the JV team. And, and now it's like, you're on the fucking field, you know, you're, you're getting close to the field at least. Mm -hmm. So this isn't, it, it took, we all kind of took things more serious and we kind of all kind of grew up a lot in one, one moment. So, uh pretty crazy man and, yeah uh, when you heard about we, the marines going into afghanistan how jealous were you guys like i imagine everybody wanted to be like that unit that was like got to go you know do the first strike after 9 11 and stuff like that was that like a thing within the infantry community like damn it you know i wish i was on that mew it was but to be honest with you man for myself individually and i think a lot of my peers to my left and my right we I knew as America, we were getting some, but like, it wasn't, it wasn't really a thing. Cause we were so fresh and so hyper-focused as you know, how the Marines are on training and especially for the most part, pre-war. Mm -hmm. Like, dude, I mean, it was, I mean, it was hard day to day just, just being a Marine at that point. So it was so, and, and plus this is before, you know, having immediate information on your phone, right? Your face, like it was so distant. And we, I didn't really watch the news and, you know, hear rumors and shit, but it wasn't like instantaneous information like it is now. So that was kind of compartmentalized to some degree. Um, so I think, you know, if that would happen to me now with the technology we have now, it would have been quite a different story. I would have been watching this, it, every video and every news story that I could on my phone. So um, in a way, I'm kind of glad, man, because it, it, it gave me and the rest of my platoon for the most part time to focus what we need to do and that's that's learning our trade you know at mm -hmm. the basic level for sure so uh we had you know we got wind that we were going to deploy with the 31st mu on the uss essex to out of okinawa so we're going to go to oki to camp hansen for six months so that was like right around the corner you know we we're super stoked my first deployment overseas was you know out of the country really it was the first country i've ever been to uh was was you know the island of okinawa so, and then everything that we traveled to within that. So what an amazing experience for a young guy, you know, out of Kansas. So, um, for real. Yeah. Yeah. And I was PT and a lot at that point already had an idea, uh, potentially of training for recon and, and, uh, trying out. So right before that deployment, I was running a lot. I'm, I'm six to two ten Now I was probably six to 
185 now i was running 17 20 17 30 pfts nice you know i was long and lanky man i was like a gazelle i can't run shit i ran today i ran two miles in like 19 minutes you know it sucked so i don't know how <laughs> actually I, I started to question like dude did we really run fucking three miles you don't even like, realize even if you're like an okay yeah. runner in the marine corps you're probably actually a really good runner in the real world yeah you know? yeah man yeah it hit me a, a while back too i was like dude am i am i older now i'm just twisting this it can't be three miles like no it was man and you crushed it it was a sprint the whole way but uh yeah man it was it was great dude i had some officers with me at fifth marines that were studs uh you know tenant day you had uh brian shantosh very famous brian shantosh google that dude bronze star recipient uh fucking stud man he was a beast and he was a he was a mustang too um but we had some killers with us man highly cerebral guys too and then uh well most of us so uh <laughs> yeah man I, I was swimming a lot i grew up in kansas so i was in the water a lot believe it or not um i water skied a lot with my family I was in the rivers and creeks a lot so swimming my mom would just leave us at the pool you know like almost every day during the summer months like oh, i was nice. a fish luckily i was just immersed in it so a lot of people don't know how amphibious reconnaissance is and it's equal to your running equal to your endurance like swimming is like a third of like how important if you suck at running or swimming excuse me you're, you're not going to make it in recon you're not you got to be a fish mm -hmm. so i was training and then i tried out for it and okay man and passed got orders to brc in uh oh two and um in brc uh Myself, a guy named Baptista and Steinsorf and one other were pulled aside at the uh, fast rope tower in Coronado at the SEAL compound. And we're told like, hey, when you guys, you guys are going to first recon, I know where you, your orders are too. Like, we're going to get some. We got, we got word we're, we're going to fucking Iraq. And that was before I even graduated recon. So that, that mindset flipped even more so uh, in the reconnaissance course. So... Yeah, dude. I mean, it's a trip in hindsight. It almost seems like a different planet, a different life, different time, man. But I For still sure. remember this. Does it so, drive? Did it drive you through BRC? You think? Do you? Did that ever like come up in your mind? Like, dude, you can't. Like, this isn't hard. Like, you got. You're going to something that's gonna be hard. No. Uh, luckily, at that time, man, I, I I had a good friend of mine. He had something posted on his uh, Stein tour. If you had posted on his his locker man it was like they can't stop time honestly i took it from evolution from chow to chow mm -hmm. day to day um everything outside the walls of this this complex for the most part of this school was was wasn't even really on the forefront of my mind honestly it was fucking daily survival just to make it through this goddamn course <laughs> so and it, it was hard i mean the title of a recon right it is it is not fucking easy man and yeah. i wanted that you know like you know, I had all the physical capabilities to, to make it and then some amongst even my peers, right? However, the mindset is everything. And it was hard, man. It, it tested it tested you, you know. And number one, dude, I, I stood amongst greats and the greats that went before me, dude, just to even be able to be in this course. I was honored to be in that course and I, I took it very serious and mm -hmm. fucked off a lot too, like like young guys do, but uh you know we had we had a good time and i'm still friends with most of those guys i still don't have my class picture i don't even want to see it because i think we had our shirts off and i think it was right with san diego bay and the bridge coronado bridge behind us dude and i'm a, probably anorexic dude like i was skinny as fuck but uh all jokes aside man very special time so you know checking in the first recon was you know as you said, that picture, man, Reed Reyes was my first assistant team leader with six man teams. We've got a TL and an ATL point, man, a medic and 18 D, um, you know, support dude. And yeah, I fell into this killer team. And, uh, like right before we pushed Iraq, the invasion Iraq, they, they basically created another team under Sergeant Aspera and I f uh, fell under Aspera as his driver and you know i had a jeep i was an off-road guy and I, I wanted no one else to fucking drive man i'm like i i will drive mm -hmm. so 
Yeah, I mean, it's a short with Rudy, very short, but man, we PT before the war. I mean, run, swim, runs, run, swim, runs, like five mile run with a gas mask and go swim three, four thousand, and then go knock out fucking 400 pull ups and push ups and then run fucking back to race back with weapons. You know, we did that fucking on the reg. Like, that's a nice times. morning, right? Dude, insane, man. And Rudy's leading the fucking way at that point. He was 32, 33. You know, oh, like, no way. He, I didn't realize he's that old. He's 52, man. And he no was way. fucking, do, he's doing backflips off of fucking Humvees. And what a maniac. That's pretty wild. Made, did you guys? Killers. Yeah, yeah, obviously. I mean, did you, was there any opportunities to do any schools before you guys deployed, or was it just straight into a workup? Uh, basically right into a workup, man. Uh, we were so hyper-focused, uh, getting on the X as a unit. Um, obviously I went through a modified pop pipeline. Um, I didn't go to jump. I didn't go to dive. I went to Sears school and then it was get to your team, get to your unit. And we're deploying in a very short time. So what did the workup look like? Uh, you know, modifying, uh, excuse me, modified shooting package. And not like I did at Marsoc, but it was so get I mean, it was world war ii esque in a sense to get these guys up to fucking par you know bare minimum and, and excel in some other ways uh but just get them get them to where we need them and let's fucking go so it was you know a lot of range stuff obviously like way more in the grounds you know in comparison and then a lot of patrolling man um lots of fucking patrolling lots you know lots of reconnaissance so uh, a lot of cross training, a lot of radio stuff. You know, that's the cool thing about the soft realm is we cross train everyone, you know, everyone's billets. We're, we're schooling each other up, a lot of medical classes. Um, yeah, it was really cool, man. And then, then OIF1 kicked off, and that was. That was that. Yeah. Did you guys expect to do reconnaissance missions, or did you get there and then find out, like, hey, we're kind of doing this, re you know, vehicle recon kind of mission? So we knew it was going to be vehicle mounted. Uh, you know, Brad Colbert, I remember going with him to some custom fucking shop in Oceanside. And we had a fucking like titanium fucking armor. Fuck before that was even a thing, dude. Brad, I mean, fuck smartest dude. I love the dude. I wondered um, if that was real when I was watching the miniseries. I was like, I wonder if they really did that. Did they, was that portrayed in the show? Yeah, he talks about it. He's waiting on his custom, his Never custom fucking- turret to come in. Yeah, I was with him, dude. We went. I remember we sat down in the owner's office, man, and had this thing he paid out of his own fucking pocket. Like, dude, we were, we did everything was custom. It was like first recon fucking truck customs, man. Like we Gucci these fucking trucks out, and uh, there was only one vehicle. I think it was Brad's. It was that had a roof. The rest of them were were open for the most part. He had some high backs, but this was before armor, dude. We, mm-hmm. we joke. So the LAR, we were in AR. We were no armored reconnaissance. That was like our inside joke, dude. Like we had fucking from Derma, like true story. I just talked to Rudy about this at the uh, recon sniper foundation party in Vegas. And I'm like, Hey man, let me this up. But you remember this, but we, we got World War, oh, excuse me, uh, Vietnam era flak jackets that were in Derma that had never been thrown out. And we like stuffed them underneath their fucking seats. It's like, <sighs> The IED wasn't even word. It was fucking tank mines. So mm, we had yeah. like, like that would have done anything, right? But that you know that stuff blown up my ass. But it was, uh, it was a trip, man. It was exciting, you know. Like it was, they were gonna go fight, you know. Like this is what you sign up to. This isn't for an education. This is this is my adventure, you know. And I, I, I go on tangents about this a lot. Like this is no offense to our our. Pogue brothers and sisters, but there is a definite difference in psyche from a guy that is going in the O3 space. You are knowing that you're going to get trained to pick up a heavy ass fucking sword and it's going to be super foreign to you. But by the end of it, you're going to be wielding this fucking thing like a ninja. That is your job is to impale that into a fucking human being. And that is it. It's not college, it's not dress blues, it's not fucking high and tights. My job is to be the fucking arm when our government, our empire says, take them out. That's your fucking job. Like, it's not turning wrenches. It's not any of this. So, mm-hmm. you know, 10, 10% of the Marine Corps actually fucking fights, which is roughly 20,000 Marines. And how many actual of those Marines actually see combat? It's a really fucking small number if you do the math on it. So there is, there is in my mind, two separate types of veterans, right? There are legit combat vets that are fucking been the dude in 
the arena have been tested and then those that aren't. And I'm not saying one's better than the other, but there is a difference. And like the guys I fucking joined up with, man, like we, I mean, we were damn near psychopaths, dude. Like, like <laughs> harnessed, harnessed hate, hyper focused hate. Cause that's what you need. You're not fighting happy, man. They're like fighting and happy. Don't go together. You, you, you use your pain, you use your energy, the training to, to get the fucking job done. And there's no excuses. There's not, if you're a shit bag and you're hated, you're the fuck out of the unit, man. I mean, that's, that's the real deal. I mean, it's first name basis. Like it is. So I wanted that. I wanted to be at the big boys and dude, it was, it was legit, man. And I was still a very young 23 year old, you know, my mindset is definitely different than what it was then. Um, but similar in some ways, I mean, you know, that's 20 years ago for me. And looking back, I was still almost a teen in the mind. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, a lot of us are, some of us were teens, you know, were you, were you aware of like the historical significance of what you were doing? Like, Hey man, this is going to be like in history books. You know, this is like one of those things. Not at all. Well, Yes and no. I, not so much on like the generation kill aspect, but yeah, not that. I'm talking about just yeah. the invasion of a country, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I, there were so many service members going across the line. I, I knew that everyone's doing their part, but I, I knew as a country, yes, that um, it was pretty monumental. I mean, dude, this is, and we've all heard that term that you know every every decade, every two decades, there's a war, and that's kind of been the trend right little proxy wars are full born but this was this was gen x's fucking war man mm -hmm. and it's all time you can't you can't a lot of dudes join to get some right and they join to pick up that sword and it never happens and it's not their fault you're born when you're born you join when you join and whatever's cooking off is cooking off at that time you have no fucking control of that so it was all time in place it was all luck or unluck yeah yeah, yeah. It's depending how you look at it. So how are you guys feeling right before the invasion? Like the days leading up to it, was everyone like psyched, ready to go? Like, we feel like we were, we got this under control. Like how, what was the, what was the vibe within the teams? Dude, we were, we were fucking hungry, man. This is, this is focused energy and it's coming to a fucking head. This pimple is about to pop and it's like hour by hour, day by day. Mm -hmm. Crossing the LOD, the limited advance. Like we were, inches away and minutes away from crossing that line and come to find out we were the first to cross the line on the Western front as the army pushed East and North on their, their sector. So being, you just being in a, you know, a white boy from Kansas, dude, pretty, you know, you grow up where you grow up, you, you look how you look, you know, like, like you're pretty Americanized in so many ways. And here we are. And, the foreign land, the sands, literally the sands of time and old culture, sure. you know, the hearing, hearing the, uh, the five prayers a day. I mean, it was so national geographic to me. It was so, it might've been on Tatooine and star Wars, man. It was in a different fucking planet. Like, and it was fucking badass. Like it was, you're hyper aware, you're hyper awake and it hyper sucks. But like, <laughs> it's, it's, got it's to. It's got to, man. But like, dude, you, you, every show that we watched and every story we've heard, like first recon, second and not the Carlos Cathcott, Hathcock's books to Rambo platoon, uh, you know, all of them, dude. Like I grew up on that, but being there, it was just fucking mind blowing, man. Like here we cool. are. We're here. You know, we're still training while we're there too. We're training. We're, we're getting our trucks ready. We're prepping our fucking gear. You know, I bought a lot of fucking cool gear and kind of the cool thing about being a recon, you kind of wear what you want for the most part instead of the left, right, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The really, really tight parameters the the, the aperture on the parameters were definitely opened up a little bit. So the more importantly, dude, I got to say this and I mean this with every fiber of my soul, the guys that I stood next to you, and I think everyone feels this way about their experience in the military to some degree. Like that's, it's not the system of the Marine Corps that I love. It's the dudes that I stood next oh, to. Oh, for sure. And uh, I wouldn't, I'd do it all over again, to be honest, but it'd have to be with the same fucking people. Yeah. 
I wouldn't change one of them. And you know, it's <clears throat> you wouldn't change any, but if you went back and did it again with another group, that same kind of vibe would probably come out of it. The same kind of like feelings. Cause For- there's so many personalities within the Marine Corps and the military in general that as long as like, you're a cool dude, like, you know, that, I don't know. You just get so many cool dudes from different areas hanging around with each other. It's funny seeing everybody yeah. rub off on each other and like Southern people mess around with people from the cities and stuff. You know, I love that, man. Like the USA America is a melting pot. The Marine Corps is a hyper melting pot. It's a little tiny pot of America. You got some Puerto Ricans from the Bronx, you know, you've got a really good friend of mine, you know, dark black for fucking Senegal that speaks French and fucking American, you know, like I do, we, as you've heard, there's this different, shades of green we're all green there's dark green and light green you know and i love that analogy dude like fuck the racist bullshit that's going on like Mm -hmm. as you as you know like we're all brothers man shin from korea to you know our our russian buddy to uh uh what was his fucking name he's actually from china like the dude left to me in fucking boot camp i was telling the story his name was karachinko he's from russia you know he's like six foot fucking 20 you know it was like (laughs) head hit the fucking roof you know like it's such a melting pot and and a guy you should follow too his name's kawa malay he's born in afghanistan and he came over here and i met him over at fucking at three five he did five six years he got out then went to the q course became a green beret and retired as an 18 bravo as a green beret and speak starry you know like like it Marine Corps like definitely sucks in some characters and some some big hearted, you know, a lot of people think that Marines are just these robotic killers. And that is true when it comes to actually going kinetic, but you'd be surprised how many big hearted, kind guys fill those fucking ranks, dude. Oh, for you know? sure. Yeah, for and, sure. I mean, willing to help help people out. You know, it's a it's a reflection of society, really. You know, there's a lot of good people in the military. There's some shitty people. You know, there's some really fucked up people. But you know, yeah, you can't weed them all out. But it's a really good. Yeah. I think a lot of people realize how good the military really is once they leave it, and then they're back at their own neighborhood or their own town or wherever, and you're around a bunch of people that just don't give a fuck. Yards are overgrown. You know, you go by someone's yard and it's overgrown or whatever. Or someone's at the at the. You, you, it looks like, uh, remember that website, the people of Walmart or whatever, you know, you like see that in reality, you know, it's like, that's the kind of shit you don't really see on base, you know, or yeah. the military environment. It's like a different world. Yeah. You're held to a higher standard. There's accountability for it. And there, there's repercussions for your actions as well. And, and, you know, there, there's turds, you know, like there's, like we said, man, I mean, there's turds in every title of profession in the world, but the more of them get weeded out, and more of them get that weed within them as an individual, that, that psyche change within that individual that's, you know, was predominantly lazy before that, or mm-hmm. had some bad traits, like or being, being in this, this, this circle, almost like avatar, man, like the energy of your left and right, like kind of brings you up for sure. Your peers, your peers bring you up to, you know, something you probably would have done before. And now it's like, I'm going to let him down. Or I'm going to embarrass myself. Or I'm going to get booted out of this unit. Like I need to, I need to grow the fuck up, mm-hmm. you know, and that's, that's change. It's positive change. So, yeah, um, that's something I talked to on the last episode with Tom Satterley, you know, he was talking about being over at Delta and I was like, you know, even at Delta, somebody's the worst guy, you know, which means you're probably a, a rock star anywhere else. But in that, yeah. you know, in that environment, yeah. you're, you're not a, a rock star, but because of that, even what would be a rock star anywhere else is like, hey, I'm not good enough. I gotta try harder, and it pushes them like to that next level that it's just so hard to achieve. You know, that drive to not fail, to drive to, you know, when you're getting sent on these like uh, no fail missions, like for real, <laughs> it's like, I don't know. You have to really be the best you can be, which is uh, a all dedication. In. You know, all in, man. It's. Uh... It's really, really cool you talk about that because it's true. It's this is, you know, this isn't the Boy Scouts, man. You're you're a fucking warrior, you know, and you are amongst others. And within these groups, these subgroups, you know, there's always an alpha and then there's betas. But then these groups, and your lowest beta there, and a regular dude in the street, that dude's a beast, you know. But that's just the natural pecking order of sniffing butts and Clydesdales flared noses, you know. It's it's. That's how it is. And that's where these, these men 
rise to the occasion and they naturally lead, you know, and I've had luckily amazing officers like minus one. And he wasn't that, he was just should have never became a Marine, to be honest, especially on the O3 side. But uh, all of my officers, I'd follow, I'd follow through the gates of hell and back. That was a question I was going to ask um, because the, you haven't seen the miniseries, but the miniseries portray some of the officers as being basically morons. You know, some of the recon officers. I was like, man, that's a, if that's not how they really are, that's a really tough, you know, dig at them. That, that, that's, that sucks. That's, that's, a re- that's the reputation that they have now. Yeah, you know, again, it's Hollywood, um, and they're squeezing seven episodes, what, seven hours, maybe even double that, 14 hours of trying to encapsulate, as actors, legit fucking warriors, Mm -hmm. one, you're trying to portray dudes that, like, are trained to stick people in the neck, you know, there's a difference there, and I'm not, I'm not shitting on any of those guys, but that's a tough, to, to, to replicate it all that's a hard thing to do as a fucking director and producer right especially crazy fucking recon marine so you know evan evan wright who wrote the book um is a good dude and i'm still friends with him this day a tall son of a bitch he's like six four six five i forgot how big he was until i saw him last last two years ago in fucking la but you know imagine all this is this perspective is from a civilian writer sitting in a vehicle you know completely feeling out of place and then you're going to war and you're around marines like dude you got to be feel individually pretty alienated and Mm -hmm. he's witnessing through these goggles of of a civilian from la you know what i'm saying so you know he's seeing things from his perspective and plus he was older than a lot of us were um i was a corporal at the time you know so my interaction with the higher ups was pretty limited man and it was yes sir no sir roger that mm-hmm. you know i'll let the fucking gunny know whatever you fucking tell me sir you know like you know i'm pretty far removed from the high level decision process as any four so and especially 23 now that i'm 20 years older i hate to be in charge of a bunch of fucking us you know like yeah. goddamn. You know what I'm saying? I would hate to be like a first sergeant or something, man, just waiting on that phone call every weekend. Yeah. Like <sighs> every every weekend, man. Who's in jail? Who's pregnant? Who's got an STD? No good. Wait, Who's was it a, weird? Who, was it weird having a uh, journalist with you guys? Not really, man. Because that, that kind of and this falls back to your question of like the surrealness of the whole thing. Um, we had two or three other potential reporters that were going to in bed with us. And mm-hmm. one was from uh, Men's Health or Men's Journal. And as soon as he learned about our mission, he's like, you guys are fucking nuts. And he was on a flight to fuck back to the States. <laughs> fucking then, pussy. Yeah, and there was another guy. <laughs> there, was, there was another guy too, man. And he bounced. And I can't remember where he, what mag was he from, but this dude walks in. They don't want it that bad, huh? And it, yeah, he came in and uh, we all heard a little bit about him that he wrote for Hustler Magazine. So... Our- <laughs> Our, our little fucking horn dog asses, man. We're like, fuck yeah, dude. And like, we instantly kind of already like we're accepting of this fucking perv into our tent, you know. You brought your credentials, I see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You'll fit right in. It was like I think all of us. It was like one of our first questions to the guy, man. And you know, he fit in, dude. And uh, it is weird ass. We're all weird and in our own fucking way. So. You know, it was a treat to have him there, man. And, and someone has ascribed to record this event, you know, and this, like you said, was, you know, it didn't really hit me, I think, until a day or two before. And especially as we crossed that line, I'm like, holy shit. I'm like, this is, this is intense. Yeah. So, and that's when reality, like, was definitely, definitely hit in the face and in the nose and in the eyes. When you crossed the line, how long was it before you guys got any, into any kind of contact? I know a lot of a lot of the first contact was around Nazaria for a lot of units. Was it the same for you guys? or same, same for us, man. It was an easy peasy drive in the fucking outback, basically, of Australia, man. It was like, you know, green little pockets of rivers and cool cliffs. Like visually, it was gorgeous you know, in its own Martian landscape way. And then Right when we pull up to Nazaria, we get when there's a fucking giant fight going down, mm-hmm. and we uh, we pull up to Nazaria, and I think we turned around, 
and we spent the night like in our fucking trucks, dude, and just just sat there until day broke, and it was fucking it was freezing my dick off. But we, we could hear the fighting. They were shooting fucking artillery. No, they were shooting artillery when we crossed the LLD, man. It was like fucking Star Wars, man. Me as a driver under fucking seven Bravos, you know, I'd seen wrap rounds, rocket assist, you know, propelled artillery rounds, just thousands, tens of thousands, as far as you could see left and right, just at a 45 going off and disappearing in the clouds, as far as you can see, man, hundreds of miles away. Like it was the, the amount of firepower we unleashed once we crossed that line as support going over us was just fucking mind boggling. So, but fast forward to Nazaria, um, we go in the next day in the morning and it just, it was a different, it was a different day, man. That was, that was the first day for me, the war started for the most part. And we got when there was a fight, you hear it, man. So you're already prepped. And I had my fucking M4 because I was driving my A1 and uh, had it on my fucking lap. And I remember passing, I was thinking about this taking a shower, man. I thought about it a long time, but if Jessica Lynch, uh, she got fucked up and a lot of her compadres died. She got kidnapped. So I remember passing her on B in the dragon wagon, whatever the military acronym for that fucking tow truck thing, the long bed tow truck dragon oh, wagon. Oh, the LSV? I think so. Um, yeah, like bullet holes in the glass. It was the first time I've seen human blood like that oozing, like literally oozing from the doors and falling on the ground. It was the first time I've seen like the real deal, real bullet holes. So, uh, passing that was just like, holy fuck, man. And we get up to this bridge and, uh, all three companies, man, Alpha Bravo, Charlie plus HQ, H and S was there. We've got this giant perimeter and, uh, dude, Hueys are fucking flying by. It's like fucking Vietnam, dude. Hueys are flying by. Crew chiefs are fucking getting it. You know, we're taking mortars. We're fucking... I had a video camera, dude. I was recording everything. <laughs> like, I was so just like, holy shit. And uh, I remember recording. And in fact, Evan, here, that's funny. That's me right there in front of the Humvee, right at the same spot. And I just put my fucking camera down. Evan, right? Generation Kill sent it to me not long ago. It's, it's actually a sick ass picture. Mm -hmm. But, uh, a mortar landed like not far from me, man, not from, from us and knocked over a fucking uh, telephone pole, like shorted out and like arced and fucking landed like real close to me, dude. I'm like, ah, there comes the camera. It's going away. Yeah. Time to work. So, yeah, man. So, you know, we were going to do some missions on foot, but, you know, in hindsight, I'm glad we like held fast and stayed there as a unit. And we got word. I think we spent the night there again, <laughs> we fucking pushed over the fucking bridge or we held in, in the same day we pushed over the bridge and the first american kia was a group of fucking marines uh and amtraks and they took an rpg seven i believe and there was a bunch of dead marines on the ground dude and i drove two feet from them smoking charcoal gray fucking cracked open amtrak with a bunch of fallen marines and, and disheveled you know, shell shock looking Marines looking around. They're they're in the middle of a fight. We drove right through it. So that was the first time I saw American KIA. And at this point, I threw out all this training and naturally, you know, you don't get fucking PowerPoint classes to handle fucking death. It's just kind of part of part of the trade. You kind of kind of comes with it, right? So yeah. seeing it and then be, being desensitized from it, uh, and wanting to be in the carnage, you know, I saw it and it was just like, holy fuck, you know. So pucker factors there, man. I mean, you're 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 not you're not Kansas anymore. You know what I'm saying? This For is real, this, yeah. This is the real deal. So uh, we pushed through that. We kind of got off the X. The whole area, I would say, like three, four square kilometers was the X. We got out of there, made a left turn, made a right, and then we took some fire. We dismounted. We got next down. We, I remember taking a knee next to this fucking flatbed truck. And Abrams had rolled through there, I think Army, if not Marines, but definitely tanks. I remember taking a knee, and they were, like, scoping out our long – I wasn't a sniper at the time. But our long guys were pushing out with their optics and kind of getting a feel for the spot, for the area. And I remember looking down, I thought I thought was, like, a giant bag of smashed fruits. 
And then I'm like, literally my knees like basically in it. I'm like looking around and then I look down again and I see a little hair tuft blown in the wind and I'm like, and teeth. And I'm like, this human being was like a half inch spread out over like fucking seven, eight feet. And I'm like, in a knee in it. I'm like, oh, fuck. That, that dude got run over a hundred times. So the pure carnage of war is, you know, that a lot of guys seeing this stuff is it's kind of hard to, I call it like going into the black, you know, it's like murder, death, killing. It's so taboo in our societal cultures. And then going over there and seeing this, you know, like a part of you definitely permanently fucking changes and a part of this embeds into your soul to some degree, my, my, my own expression. And, you know, you're not green behind the eye. You don't have green eyes anymore, man. You know, you're not wet behind the ears anymore. Like a part of you permanently grows up in this moment. And now we all come back changed from this, man. We're seeing mm-hmm. something that, on a huge scale, a very minute group of individuals get to be a part of. And, you know, like I don't crave it. You know, I think I craved it for a bit, just the action of it. And then now that I'm older, you know, I hope to never smoke another human being again. <laughs> yeah. I mean, truly, I mean that. Yeah. Um, it's, it is what it is. And I'm not afraid to fight by any fucking means, but I think we have the authority and the, the, the experience to speak on what we witnessed. Right. So like we, we can, we're not the arm, we're not arm, armchair quarterbacking this. Like I'm telling you it is what it is. You know, I, I still would fight for a good fucking cause. Um, it's just gotta be a just and a righteous cause. So, um, yeah, man, that was that first day in the Nazaria area was fucking crazy. And then from that moment on, was just fucking game on dude every day was you know taking fucking anti-aircraft from a zsu tac four four barrel fucking anti-aircraft gun and thank god one barrel was was working uh from a tree line like fucking coffee cans dude that were like star wars wobbling in the air that made this crazy tie fighter sound it was so badass we had prisoners and fucking five tons right next to us dude then a cobra comes in and fucking blows that thing apart you know, it's just it's a fucking Call of Duty, but in your eyes. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like it's 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 crazy. It's got to be so surreal. You know, almost like this feels like a movie. You know, like shits, like all this is happening around me. You know. Yeah, you know, and then they made it into a movie, which is even more fucking surreal. It's super surreal. That's true and too. then it was captured and put into a movie, and now it's like, you know, and we're one sixteenth of what of other guys were out there fighting, you know, and this was our experience, but this experience is damn near, damn near equal to similar to most dudes that got into ticks with the enemy. Yeah. Pretty wild one for sure. Were you guys ever kind of, um, bummed out that you, you didn't have like a traditional reconnaissance mission, you know, set up or was it like, ah, you know, this is what we got to do. So yeah, man, like, I think we just understood the mission. Like we understood General Mattis' plan for us in mm-hmm. the shock troops. Drive fast as fuck, get to your position, and wait for follow-on instructions, basically. So we got it, dude. We were hauling ass, and we outran our fucking log train. And, like, we were out of food for, like, 10 days. You know, like, it was... We blasted. We blitzkrieg, by definition, through through towns, through villages to, to Baghdad. And then from there, operations continued north to Bakaba to... Linking up with LAVs and other Cobras. I mean, I saw some gnarly as shit. Like, human beings on fire, crawling. You know, no skin, no fucking hair. Still moving like a zombie to Fuck. a bus that was blown up, shitting human beings. And they were all fucking dudes that were, they are all combatants. You know, RPGs, RPKs, PKMs everywhere, AKs everywhere. And Cobras lit them the fuck up. You know, like, it was insane. You know, like if if you could put on TV the shit that I actually saw and that we saw in those moments, like holy fuck, dude! Like Generation Kill was a fucking one thirty second of like what actually went down, and that was deployment one. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm sure. saying. What was the what was the reaction of like the locals and stuff as you guys were pushing through these villages, these hamlets and stuff? 
you know, it uh, depends. You know, Sunni Shia and like their allegiance to Saddam. Um, it kind of depends on where you go, where you went, excuse me. Um, but for the most part, man, it was, they've been living under oppression from Saddam and his reign for a long time. So I think initially I would sum it down to like, they seemed pretty inviting. Um, and our heads too, as, as combatants, like I, I didn't think we were going to be there, but more than six to a year that America is going to be the fuck out. I didn't know it was going to be a 20 year deal. Yeah, you know, get and, in, and let them take it over, or like take out Saddam and them, and then pull out and let them take it over, and you know, go yeah. themselves. Yeah, man. You know, especially as a young twenty-three-year-old, you know, pretty politically, pretty apolitical for the most part, and, and the higher level of thinking that I had at that point, strategically speaking, was not what it is now. Yeah. So, but I know for all of us, most of us anyway. You know, it was, we saw a pretty receptive uh, civilian population. Um, You know, I I remember dearly kids and other adults saying, Bush, Bush good, you know, sticking out their thumbs, double thumbs, Bush good, you know, high fives and hellos and, you know, this foreign military, you know, I remember seeing a kid with a Metallica shirt on, dude, and I was like, what the (laughs) fuck? You know, you've heard of these guys, that's awesome, so... Name three songs right now. Take yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's funny you said that. I was thinking about that the other day at the, at the gym. So I was okay with the Metallica shirt. Like, name fucking one album, dude. Like, do it. <laughs> Would have ripped that fucking thing off you. But uh, yeah, man, it was pretty receptive. And like, to answer that statement question is, we outlasted our fucking welcome, dude. And when a lot of civilians started dying innocently, and we just with this invader, mm-hmm. this foreign fucking predominantly white invader that believes in pretty Judeo-Christian beliefs against a heavy Islamic country, two ideologies, two cultures, like we, yeah, dude, quickly it fucking turned. And it was, you, you could start, you could start to see, like even the second deployment, it was night day difference between the first to how receptive they were of us. So, how long, but, when, when you guys got back, how long was it before you went out on your second deployment? Dude, I think it was like, I might be making this up because it's fucking foggy to me, but I think six, eight months. It was less than a year. That's probably right. So, that seems about um, right for the time frame. Yeah, it was uh, in that time frame and that op tempo stayed like that for fucking 10, 15 years. Now, know, coming like, back after doing the invasion, what were you thinking? You know, you think like, hey, we, you know, did you guys have any new guys? Were you going back thinking like, hey, we've been there. We got a little experience. This isn't going to be too bad. Like what was in your, what was in your mind and how did you guys train to prepare for it? Super stoked to come back, to live through it. One, uh, it was so good. It, it put an emphasis on how much I love this country and how much I took for granted. And you realize that over there being emaciated and hungry and dirty, I didn't shower. We didn't shower for like 120 days, dude, you know. So just coming back was so exciting. And I thought Iraq was so distant until very quickly we got wind that we're going back <laughs> to this town called Fallujah, and which I didn't know anything about. So the super stoked happiness was kind of, you know, capped off with like, all right, switching to second gear now to prep, prep them to go again. But that first month back to you was quite awesome. Uh, first Marine Division, we had a parade in Oceanside, California. Um, the entire division, dude, and we marched, and like everyone was there, and it was like it reminded me of potentially what it might have been like in World War II, you know, when our soldiers and Marines and service members came back. Uh, sadly, not like Vietnam, but um, dude, it was pretty surreal, man, and that was, you know, short, short lived. So um, things changed very rapid planning and going to, to YF2, um, a lot more schools, uh, the training improved. Um, it was, we got a, for me individually at Bravo 2 again, uh, Dan Griego became my platoon sergeant who was a fifth force dude. His whole career was force recon. I had a stack, not that stacks matters dude, but like went over his fucking shoulder, like almost went around his body. Like this dude had more shit on his fucking, 
Dude, it was, it was the bo- the biggest stack I've ever seen. And you got to jump and dive. It's like dive fucking bubbles were like got damn near on top of his fucking collarbone. That's funny. Stud, man. I still love the guy. But like his force experience, especially on the Dasser uh, direct action aspect, uh, we started doing some cool shit, man. And, and we knew IF2 was going to definitely be more CQB city urban instead of and based out of one spot and running patrols out of there. So that reconnaissance mission that you asked about went from fucking, what's that movie where they're all in the fucking desert and the fucking vehicles, Mad Max to fucking, we're about to do DA and SR, special reconnaissance dude. We're about to do real patrols and real, real fucking hits like we're trained to do. So uh, going into the mindset for all of us, we got to dump a boots. To answer your question earlier, we got we got a uh, for you listeners out there, we got uh, some new younger Marines, most of which have not been to BRC. Their 0311s attached to first recon that we're going to go to recon school after this deployment. Mm. So, and so we got these kids, man, eight, eighteen to like twenty year olds, and they were mouthy little fucking arrogant bastards, and uh, still friends with all of them. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it was our our chance to be the seniors, right? You know, I never got that chance in the grunts because I fucking bounced and went to recon. So this was my time to be, you know, a leader. And they looked up to us. Um, they were still mouthy as shit and they still are. So uh, talking to you, John Dubler. But, uh, <laughs> that's that's crazy that they're going to go on a deployment with recon without having gone through BRC yet. Yeah, we needed bodies, man. We need fucking warm meat in the boots. And they were definitely in support roles, but they they weren't pussies. They weren't. I mean, they were dudes that were going to get some. Some are lawyers, you know, master's degrees, very intelligent, capable fucking dudes. They just had did not have the chance to go to BRC. Yeah. So and most of them did, but uh, OF two was quite a bit different. Um, what was going on in Fallujah when you guys were heading over? Did, were you guys getting intel before you went, or was it just something you got kind of read up on when you got there? A little bit above, and definitely a lot more when we got there. Um, you know, I, I knew of it being a very shady place. I knew our proximity to it from the Met Camp to uh, Fallujah was not far. It was like 5, 10K from the southeast corner at the Cloverleaf. I could be making that up, but it was pretty fucking close. Um, you know, it's just, just a different experience being static for the most part in one area. Mm-hmm. Um Tigris, Euphrates, the highways, uh, human population, the civilian population in the area, you know, it was a lot more intimate, man. A lot more boot time on the ground. So we didn't, you know, IEDs, that was a thing starting that deployment. Um, that was not a thing in OIF-1, not, not one. Uh, IEDs, command detonated by by wire by dead cord was the first and they were completely rudimentary and fucking for the most part their timing was pretty fucked up mm-hmm. but month to month month our adversary quickly countered our ttps and sops and they they especially with the help of iran and other other people they parlayed man they fucking yanked to our bank like they they started as a good enemy and I respect the way they fought. They fucking were going against a pretty fucking well-oiled machine, and they were doing everything they could to counter it. And they did a decent job. Um, but the combatants we faced in OF2 were night and day different than OF1 for the most part. Well, so in a very short time, they they fucking they met us face to face. Yeah. When you got there, were you guys falling in and like ripping out with somebody, replacing somebody, or were you guys falling in and starting a new mission from that base? It's funny you say that, man. Uh, I don't think we did a rip tell. I don't think we did. Um, we could have. And I say this because I had a surgery done. Um, I'm half the man I used to be, we'll put it that way. And uh, basically, if I was a porn star, I'd be hung solo. So, uh, yeah, man, I they left me behind to get the surgery, and I had a bruise up to my belly button, and like damn near down to my knee to get this testicle taken out. And then they're like, "You're good enough, you're going." So 
I missed the first 10 days, two weeks there. So there might've been another unit. I don't think there was. Um, but how I ended up in Fallujah, the uh, reason I bring this up is I was with another guy who became an officer. He's a Mustang, old JB, John Brown. And uh, it was him and myself, maybe one other guy, but we were attached to this basically a POG unit. And they took us from Al-Assad or TQ and drove us to the Met camp. They gave me one magazine. And I didn't really know the route. Didn't know fucking shit, dude. And they made a wrong turn and ended up in South Queens and fucking Fallujah. And I think we were like the first Americans to go through Fallujah and God knows how long. Mm -hmm. And dude, we would have all been annihilated if they fucking said jump. So I, I didn't see one female. All I saw was fucking a bunch of dudes in black. And there were dudes everywhere up on the roofs and the windows and the doorways and the streets. Like we went through South Queens, dude, which was a hot spot. And thank fucking God they didn't pull the fucking trigger, dude. Cause it would have been, I've never trained with these dudes. I don't know their backgrounds. Like that could have been a fucking shit sandwich. I probably wouldn't be here. Uh, made it to the mech, linked up with the boys. And then OJT, man, started fucking, you know, get in where I fucking fit in. So, did a lot of range shit. We shot there at the Met camp. You know, even when we weren't on missions, we were fucking shooting and training and still PT. And I PT my ass off out there. They had a pool, got the, got the recon swim on, which is pretty cool. No, that's uh, nice. So, you guys had a pool? Nice. Yeah, Saddam. You know, Saddam had a fucking pool out there right next to his palace. So, yeah. of course, the recon dudes are taking that shit over. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, oh. man. Fallujah was fucking crazy. What kind of missions were you running? Lots of foot patrols, man, like yeah. mounted to VSOs to walking off the fucking camp. We did a uh, Charlie company uh, with Rudy Rays. They were doing the shit. They had a mission called the Trojan Horse mission. They were in did dressing like locals, a comedy or some fucking shitty fucking Iraqi, Iraqi Impalas. They were just driving down the street, collecting intel, man. We got into a few ticks, blasting saws out the back window like fucking the movie Heat. So we were kind of doing shit. We were the first combat jump um, outside of tier one guys since fucking Vietnam. Uh, I think Alpha Company jumped uh, into a mission, which was pretty sick. And half of them landed in a fucking canal on the strand. But full mission profile at night and uh, a hostile setting. So uh, I was pretty jealous I didn't get a jump out of that one. But uh, Was it pretty static line or was it a uh, free fall? I don't remember, man. That's a good question. Um, I don't know. I, I, I want to lean on static. I want to lean on static, but I, I don't know that answer. It's a good question, man. I always wonder, like, if we're going to keep that around forever. You know, the static line jumping. You know, is it, is it is it? It's a good way, obviously, to put a whole bunch of people on the ground in a place. But is it realistic in in this day and age? You know, I do believe so, man. Um, I believe so, dude. It's it's my experience with static, you know, fucking heavy weight, jumping heavy gear, a little bit more accurate, keep the team together a little bit tighter. Um, I think there's simplicity with it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do. I do think so, man. I really do. The shoots that we were flying were fucking pretty badass, big ass MMPS. Uh, the multi, I can't remember the square footage of this fucking thing. It was massive. The forward drive on this thing under canopy is pretty pretty amazing. Um, did a lot of training with that at my Marsau time. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I think so. I could be wrong. You never know, right? But back in – so back at Fallujah, what year was this that you were there? Oh, four. Oh, okay. So was this – this was prior to the invasion then? Uh, the invasion or Fallujah – Fall, excuse me, not the invasion. Fallujah 1, was this like before Fallujah this, 1 and between Fallujah 1 and Fallujah 2? Or? This, is, this is Fallujah 1. So, oh, okay. So you were there when the when the contractors were hung from the bridge and all that? I was about 400 meters away. Oh, no shit. Fuck. Yeah, that was, on the, that was on the north side of Fallujah, man. We were bed down on the tracks. Fucking. Can you describe a, that? Some people may not know what we're talking about. Can you describe what we're talking about? Yeah, so there were some uh, contractors that were all prior soft guys, one of which was a very famous SEAL. Um, they were basically doing courier missions at that point. They were from my recollection going from a to b with with mail or some kind of some kind of 
drop of some important stuff, but I do want to think it's like on the male side. And I don't know how many were hung and killed, but they were basically, that was kind of the catalyst to what was to come. And basically they were surrounded on the north end of Fallujah, drug out of the cars, killed, and then drug in the streets, lit on fire, declothed, and then hung basically upside down on the bridge in Fallujah. And American personnel, Mattis was, was in control at that point. And that was that was the fucking torch. That was the match in the fucking the barn. Like it, from that day on, it was fucking. I think at the strategic level, was was definitely like we're not fucking around. Mm-hmm. So uh, we already knew it was very lawless. We already knew it was pretty pretty crazy. We've already been in a couple fights at that point. But yeah, man, uh, Fallujah was Ramadi. Fallujah was Stalingrad. Uh, Fallujah was. Was a, was the gates of hell? I mean, it was a dark, filled to the brim with fucking combatants. Uh, we push through psyops and drop them leaflets. I remember seeing thousands of women and children and non-combatants leave. So anyone that was there, it was game the fuck on. We advertised that we were going to take your city. So uh, we went into the city uh, on the north end. Um, crossed the same railroad tracks, took one Katusha rockets on the way in, um, and then took over a fucking house and stayed in like three days there. Um, they did operations out of there, watched Jade Ams get dropped across the street. It was pretty fucking crazy. And then we pulled out and then conducted operations in the, the local area. You know, we were, you know, the, the famous incident with Abu, Gar- Abu Ghraib. The prison where the stupid fucking Americans were abusing the fucking prisoners. I still like to knock all their fucking teeth out because what that did, that changed whatever was left over with the Iraqi people towards us once that got out, especially as religious as they are. We lost all fucking all momentum at that fucking point, dude. And yeah. the people the people fucking turned. And I hope these fucking punk bitches know this. Like they, they fucked us, man. And a lot of people died because of this incident. So that specific area wasn't far from Fallujah. And they basically hired fucking recon to take out the teams of mortarmen that were shooting and launching mortars into Camp Fallujah, the Mech, and into Abu Ghraib. So we started conducting missions out of Abu Ghraib prison. Uh, and we're haunting fucking mortar teams. And we definitely got some as a unit. So it was... It's a wild fucking time. Isn't this around the time that you received uh, you your actions? You got awarded the Silver Star for your actions around this time frame? Yeah. Uh, April 7th. Um, uh, yeah, obviously remember the day clearly. Um, we were going to go. There was an ammo supply point west, southwest of Fallujah called the Rock ASP. Blackwater was there protecting this massive ammo supply point. And we were going to conduct operations out of there. So we were going to drive from the Met camp to camp uh, to the rock ammo supply point. And we've been there before, but we were going to do like a week or two of missions out of there. And we got hit really hard on the way there. We got hit actually before the big tick that that day was famous for. It was, I remember driving over the Euphrates and taking mortars, our unit, Bravo Company, and second platoon taking fucking mortars, <laughs> enemy mortars in the river, like fucking Vietnam style, dude, like 30 foot plumes of fucking water, like off the right flanks. We're driving across, it, and I'm just like, holy shit, man. Simultaneously started taking PKM, RPK fire uh, across on our basically our 45 to our 11 o'clock. They picked my own B to go drive down that road and engage those guys. So five of us, six of us to go engage this fucking machine gun nest. And we got down there right right there and dudes didn't close with, they fucking bounced. We didn't get any secondary engagement with those guys. So we turned back around, linked back up with you know the main body of our patrol of five vehicles. Uh, you know, made a right, then made a left. And this is where it turns. I remember seeing like a gas station and uh, there was like, 30 to 50 males with all their backs up against the the the, uh, the building, but 
all of them were kind of facing our direction of travel. They were looking at us and not one of them looked our direction. Um, in that place later, once you process all this shit, this is all happening in real time. That's where we like demeanor hit seeing these guys, not one of them were fucking looking at us. So right after that, our, uh, our captain and platoon, uh, Commander, always get Barsak and Recon. Our verbiage with team leader, team chief, platoon sergeant, platoon leader, confused because uh, we changed to Barsak. But uh, our platoon commander, uh, Captain Brent Morell, over the hooks, like, yo, this conduct five and 25s, which for everyone listening, that's vehicle slows down, driver, gunner stays in, dismounts, uh, get out, and we're going to basically get out in layman's term, just walk around and look for fucking IDs and just get out of the vehicle just in case something cooks off to where we can fucking fight. Mm -hmm. So we're all down, fucking been sitting in this stupid hot fucking truck forever. So we got out, walked. Short time after that, we walked 100, 200 meters, fucking circle back up, get in the VIX and push. And very clear in my mind this moment, um, I was behind the driver's seat on the left side of the vehicle and dude on the 50 cal team leader baptiste up in the uh, driver's seat a calm comma staffer to the right it was a generation kill guy too most of us were still from the generation kill platoon minus a few new guys and uh i remember looking over the fucking right shoulder just happened to be looking forward now i had an m16a4 with an acog i was like the dm and uh had it sticking out the fucking window, but I looked straight ahead. And at that same moment, since we were like kind of herringbone left and right with dispersion and, and being offset, I got to see the first vehicle. You know, it's up four or 500 meters. And at that moment, that exact second, I watched it get hit by, I thought was an IED. And it rocks completely to the left and black. And it's not a fucking movie explosion of flames. It just rocked this thing, almost at a 45 in my mind. And just black and brown fucking dust blows out the right side. And right at the same time, over the net, contact right, contact right. And I remember, like, looking at the trees and, like, slow motion. And then I remember seeing all this dust being kicked up to our front and to our right behind a berm. And I'm like, so this fight's now kicking off. I'm like, it's not that windy. Uh, this is happening in seconds. Mm-hmm. I remember, like, looking around. Said, is it that windy? And I look back again and I look to the right of where that dust I'm seeing muzzle flashes from the berm, which at the same time was the fourth vehicle. The fifth vehicle was our platoon Sergeant Dan Griego. He's like L shape, right? Last two vehicles, peel right, Bravo element, peel right. And we just so happened to be right at the right moment at this fucking, uh, dirt entrance to this field. We make a right. Now we're forming a fucking L shape. Like one of the best fucking maneuvers that you can be against a static enemy. And we train, to our, to our fucking blue in the face with the same scenario with fucking rocks, a little army man. Like we've gone through this thing a billion fucking times. And here it is. He calls it like a fucking coach in a football team, dude. Love the dude for this moment. He fucking arose to this occasion. Make a right, dismount. He's actually recording. He was at an open back home V and he had a fucking 50 cal Barrett on the scissor mount. <laughs> He was fucking plugging dudes with this fucking 50 cal, man. And he, <laughs> I've listened to the audio. You, you hear me running up to him. Let us go, Gunny. I like wanted to charge all these motherfuckers. So what I saw leading up to this point was there was another like creek canal then a burn. We'd like crawled up there to get eyes on and we could see all these machine gun positions for like a kilometer, dude. And there were like five, five guys in each hyper focused on the X, not one of them covering fucking Tail and Charlie. All of them being untrained fucks were getting it with RPKs. They had fucking service, uh, they had missile launchers. I say sevens, they had fucking they were fucking loaded to the teeth, dude. They were waiting for an American convoy to come by. And I'm like screaming at Gunny to let us go. And he's like, stay here for a bit. And uh, like I wanted to get some rights. He's like, stay here, get on the berm again and fucking start, start engaging. So with my M16A4 and some dudes next to me, I think Stafford was next to me, I uh, started plugging dudes in the fucking back at like maybe 150, 200 meters. He's got wind. You know, there's enemy behind him. Some of them started running 90 degrees to the right. And it was 
you know, Kentucky win it, win it, man. There's no time to adjust. So I'm seeing rounds impact in this field. I just fucking aim, you know, lead them. So, so it smoked quite a few fucking people there. We all did. At that point, kind of, he's like, move up, get in your vehicle, your vehicle alone, move up and move forward. So we move forward. I think past the first group of fucking guys, there was another entrance to break in the berm. So we got back on the MSR, make a right and uh, flip a bitch, basically point the gun back at the heavy gun uh, back towards the fucking road, kind of the north. And Stafford and I go south back to where we were initially were. So we're going back the way we came. And then Baptista uh, went solo and <laughs> fucking by himself this way, left two guys on the fucking on the vehicle and uh, went with Stafford, dude, and uh, fucking cleared a bunch of dudes up close and personal. Just the two of us had a grenade pulled. Um, one of the guys that I shot, uh, I'll never forget this, it was like the second or third dude I shot was on his left side. Stafford was up on the berm and I had this green giant open field to my left. And I was so petrified. I'll never forget how I felt in this moment. I, I just, I wasn't enough. I was just by myself. I wish I had 80 guns and 80, 80 eyes. This field was massive. And I knew I saw a lot of guys run into that fucking field. I know there's dudes in this fucking field laying down, bleeding out the cell of AKs. So luckily none of them shot, but uh, this dude I thought was dead. I get up to him. Stafford's a little bit further. He's basically at the feet. I'm kind of my toes are touching this guy's back. He's laying on his left side. And I'm like still looking at his eyes. He's fucking eyes are closed. You know, I'm like looking at the right side of his face, right, right on top of him. And I'm looking at this field. And then at the same time, I hear Stafford to my right. Yo, he's got a grenade. He's got a grenade. Right when I said that, dude wasn't dead. Dude pulled this Russian pineapple grenade and fucking dropped it. And I was just like, what the fuck? And it was like such a surreal time stopped. And I just like, I've been, I've watched every fucking movie there is. And like, this shit's happening. So I like, I fucking turn around and start running. I just start laughing because it's like so surreal. And so there's this giant fight going on. I'm like laughing because I'm like, this can't be happening. And this fucking thing goes off, dude. And we turn back around. We make it, you know, maybe 10 feet and it went off. He absorbed all of it. Bloom in half. His feet were blown back up the berm. He's like zombie fucking crawling with like his intestines hanging out, dude. Oh, he's still alive. Fuck. Yeah, he's still alive. I don't know how the fuck he lived through that blast alone, the concussion of it, but he's we like we learned we learned later that a lot of them were like on a cot slash like like fucking meth like fucking upper, mm -hmm. which which makes sense in this scenario because I just couldn't imagine someone living through that in half like a zombie dude. Stafford fucking lights him up. We push the vehicle. At this point, a fucking Cobra is like hovering over the fucking road. Like damn near you could touch its skids and like launching tow missiles into this fucking building that all these dudes squirted to. I mean, this is like a fucking movie, bro. And I'm like looking at the pilots and they're like, yeah. It's like fucking <laughs> launching, launching toes. I ended up fast forward two minutes later, I ended up tripping over a, the same tow wire land right next to a dead Iraqi wearing a combatant wearing American U S army BDUs with a, an American fucking M4 203 with an A point. Oh, wow. So, Baptista, like I said, moved up through here, uh, and smoked a bunch of dudes by himself. And that was one of them. And I landed an inch from this dude's face. His fucking teeth were exposed. He was dead, but he had a catastrophic malfunction with the M4. I didn't know how to clear it. And that's when Baptista dropped them. So me being me, I grabbed the M4 and in a quick second, mate, like I need to find out who this is. Ripped off the fucking name tape real quick, the knife, because it wasn't Velcro back then on the army anyway. Maybe it was Velcro. I thought I cut it off, whatever. And grabbed the gun, slinged it on my back and kept pushing and smoked some more guys. There's bodies everywhere. Linked back up to the vehicle We'll fast forward to the end of this, dude. Um, support. Platoon comes, a QRF, and uh, we get escorted back to uh, the base. And uh, the weirdest thing ever, I don't understand why we did this, but I'll be very blunt about it. I mean, in this moment, we're fucking Vikings. I mean, this this isn't 
you know, I'm not here to fucking shake hands and kiss babies. Like it, it's, I'm going to end everyone and anyone to get the fuck home. And they're going to do the same to us. So they can get home. Like, dude, mm-hmm. it's, it's the ultimate chess game. So Gunny makes us pick up all these dead bodies and throw these bodies on the hoods of our, our trucks. Like they're deer. Don't understand. So we took like 15, 20 bodies back through the X back to the mech camp and holding a dead human beings hands, especially the enemy. It was such a surreal moment, man. Like we're like, like you throw your sister or a cousin on a bed. Yeah. We're doing, we're doing this with these bodies and then we put them on the fucking hood and drive back through it all. The, the same people that were, like giving us a stare, we're like fucking just staring at us even harder now with these enemy that they knew were there and they've been laying there for fucking god knows how long. Like we we fucking won. This this moment we fucking won. We're, That's we're, intense, we're dude. Rolling back home. through town with bodies stacked up on the fucking hood, Jesus. Basically, a big fuck you to everyone in that area. That's and, intense for sure. Well, the worst part was is from my recollection. The and I'm just gonna be graphic about it again. You know, uh, war and, and fighting is is the ultimate failure of fucking communication. You know, like exhaust that communication until you have to go kinetic, and hopefully we don't, man. Like I'm, I'm almost like a fucking pacifist now. Yeah. But That's looking right. back, looking back then, I'm gonna fucking club fight, bite, scratch my the fuck way out of it to get home, and so are they. So. I got these bodies on the hood and they had a blood of it like has not coagulated yet. And their noses are fucking smashing on this hood over fucking 30 kilometers. Blood is all over the fucking window. The fucking windshield wipers don't work. So I'm driving. I got the fucking fuck the window down, dude. And fucking blood is like all over my fucking face. Like super fucked up, man. I probably got hep fucking z that's what i was just thinking like damn dude <laughs> dude that gnarly, is unsanitary man. sir not cool it's what was it try. like what was it like when you cruise back into base what were everybody else thinking like even the americans were probably like what the fuck my friend that i've not yet met in person you asked the right question so we make a ride off a of route mobile or, or michigan i like fucking always get confused i think it was mobile at that time i always get confused with bad dad and all my deployments uh, we make a right, and it's the last straight away to the Met camp, and it's split on left and right side of two different fobs. There's a bunch of Marines in the prone in this berm facing basically Fallujah, which is off in the distance. And they're in a tick. Mm-hmm. Like they're in a fight, like fucking with no idea. So we drive through that shit. We got these hoods covered in blood and bodies of obvious combatants. And this, I never forget this fucking Marine, dude. On the saw, and he like looks back, with his fucking helmet, and he's just like, he stands up, and he's like, "Fuck yeah!" <laughs> Fuck and yeah. like, and they're getting it, but like three or four of them were like, "America, this is metal as fuck." Dude, it was it was hard, man. You know, and I'm not a callous person, dude. Especially the older I've gotten, like I understand the importance of human life, but in this moment, as a fucking warrior, it is exactly what the fuck it is. And if you guys don't understand, I give. Fuck. Well, I it, mean, it's it. not like it's not like these were just regular Joes out there that you just smoked. These were combatants, you know. It's, like, it's, gonna, be, it was it's gonna be hard little, to feel bad for combatants that were trying to kill you, you know. You know, but there's the utmost respect for them too. At the same time, truly, like they they're ponying up to fucking fight for their land, their motherland against this invader. Like I've I've had ample time to think about this. Mm-hmm. I do not hate. I honestly, I don't think I've hated any one of them. You know, you're not the you're first. Not, you're not the first Iraq veteran that said that to me before. Actually, they said that they understand why they fought us. You know. Yeah, I do. Because I was, I, if I would have been born and raised there, I'd have been fucking throwing rocks and sticks at us too, a hundred percent. I'd have been a fucking freedom fighting son of a bitch. It's time and fucking place. I didn't choose it; it just happened. So I respect them honestly more than a lot of fucks in our own country. Like how, I would much, I'd much rather break bread and hang out with them in a peaceful setting than a lot of fuckers in our own country because they, they rogered up, dude. They pawned the fuck up to a fight. Yeah. How, you know, how did it seem like the Fallujah one? So for those that don't know, Fallujah one was right after the bodies were, were hung on the bridge, huge clear. They started going in and then the politicians were like, wait, 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 let's pull back out. Let the Iraqis kind of try to fix this. We'll let the Iraqi army, Iraqi police kind of fix this. 
Never worked out. They just reinforced the city and rebuilt it. And then that's when Fallujah 2, Phantom Fury, as most people know it, happened. And then the big full clear went through. How did it, as the first clear was happening, as that that whole battle was going, how did it seem like it was going up to the point where you guys got stopped by politicians? Good. Uh, Hard. Uh, Fighting an adversary that was unlike the first deployment. Uh, we weren't getting our dicks pushed in, but it was, I mean, it was every single day I thought I wasn't coming home. I mean, all of us, it's kind of like the Bushido code, you know, the, the samurai code, like, dude, you, you kind of live as your dad. I mean, you did. Cause if you thought and overthought about what ifs, like you're going to be in the fetal position crying for sure, like not combat effective. So I was a hundred percent real as long as every other bro next to me, like every moment of any day, even at the FOB taking fuck, we took mortars and rockets every fucking day, like six to 20 times a day for six months. And it killed a lot of motherfuckers just on the base sleeping or walking to the chow hall. Yeah. So like every day in that immediate AO of 20 fucking miles was the real deal. So it wasn't like, and I'm not talking shit on, on Phantom Fury, but the prelude leading up to that, you know, Operation Vigilant Resolve is what it was called uh was the real deal man but i am thankful i avoided the real fucking final push i'm not gonna lie about it dude like i've heard stories from all my boys in the grunts and other dudes later on like thankful i got my fucking whoop on countless times before and after that like dude now that i'm older i'm glad i'm glad i avoided it but leading up to it yeah it was was the real deal man every fucking street Every suburb, every fucking uh, palm meadow, palm grove, every canal, everything was every. There's a fucking threat everywhere. So and you did not know who they were. They weren't fighting a uniformed combatant. You know, and that's kind of the whole meat and potatoes. The entire twenty years of war, we didn't fight a, a uniform. OF one different. Yeah. Truly, OF one, we did. In pockets, Fedayeen, Republican National Guard, Republican Guard, excuse me, were uniformed uh, to some degree, but they were definitely mixed with other fighters. Yeah, uh, jihad. I remember the first group of guys that we shot and killed were from Jordan or Syria. Syria, excuse me, it's Syrian passports with like white Nikes on, wearing blue jeans. They weren't fucking Iraqi. That was yeah, the first yeah. four fuckers that we got shot at, and two guys got shot from us in that first engagement. That's all I have one. So, dude, I mean. April 7th happened. I didn't leave until October. You know, we got there in February, so two months into it. You know, let's talk about something very, very important. Uh, So the glory, the fighting, lives lost, you know. But let's circle back to, we make it back back to base from that big fight. I knew the first vehicle got hit. Didn't know. E4, Corporal, was not a... An ATL team lead was not on the net hearing major comms going on. You know, it was team internal and no idea what the fuck happened. I know there was helos all over the fucking place, Cobras, I think of 46 or Chinook. I don't know shit, dude. Mm -hmm. We get back to base, fucking KBR, Filipina chicks, fucking that service food comes out of the fucking port john and sees all these bodies all over the fucking hood instantly starts projectile vomiting everywhere uh and we're driving through like fobbit land now dude a lot of these people never leave this fucking wire and we're bringing it to their fucking doorstep and i'm sure it haunts them to this day man it's a pretty catastrophic thing to see so we dump i d- we dump all these fucking bodies about nipple high and about 10 feet wide of fucking flesh in front of the BAS, the, the, the aid station. And I walk inside covered in blood. And they're like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, oh, no, I'm good, man. Like, my gunny told me to give you this. And then it was two Air Force chicks, nurses, and they came out and started puking. They saw all these bodies, instantly started puking. And they're just like, what the fuck? So they go get their MO, their med- we had a medical officer, and he's like, get these fucking things out of here. What the fuck are you doing? I'm like, dude, gunny told me to do it. I don't know. Yeah. Corporal so, don't know. This corporal don't know. So we grab all these bodies, put them back in this trailer, drive them back to our base, across the street, literally across the street, put them in a new pile. We're eating chow 
on the hood with this there's blood everywhere i got a hot plate we're just fucking eating like, i didn't even wash dude we're eating right there there's a picture of too which is fucking mind-boggling so our whole command everyone's out there you know and then we get into basically a school circle from our uh company commander i forgot his name you know fucking stan neil sit and uh our commander says Gives us a 411 of what actually happened at a high level. So did not know that my captain platoon commander was shot in the chest and he died in flight on the way out. I had no idea that our captain was shot killed. Eddie Wright took an RPG, that RPG. Uh, he had made half doors. They had a M249 saw, para saw, like soft style saw, short barrel, short stock. He was getting it on the tripod on the fucking scissor mount, fucking laying waste. And he took a direct hit to the gun for the RPG. Damn near blew his jaw off. Damn near fucking bled out of the fucking his leg. Blew his arms off instantly. Uh, everyone in the vehicle gets fucked up from that RPG. So that whole time we were fighting, I had no idea. Dudes were fighting for their fucking life on that X. Because mm -hmm. um, they were four vehicles up, three vehicles up, uh, ahead of me. Like hundreds of meters. A different fight, different war. Mine was going on back here. I had no fucking idea a few hundred meters away that my boys were fucking. I mean, Crazy. I wish I'd have in hindsight, I'd have been fucking running on foot and fucking capping all these dudes in the back of the head. Like it's crazy. That... It's crazy how it's that much different. Only a few hundred meters ahead of you, you know? Yeah. I had no idea it happened the whole way home. I'm feeling fucking good. It was like shooting fish in a barrel. I'm like, that was fucking easy. Like bring it bitches that no idea dudes were fighting for their fucking life and lost their life. How did they, so, uh, how did like the platoon and stuff like react to that? You know, you have somebody killed, it kind of changes people. Some people's perspectives are like, oh shit, you know, this got way more real than it has been. You know, uh, it got real, but we'd been in so many fights already and around it and heard all the debriefs of other units getting fucked up. Like, mm -hmm. it was about as real as you can get anyway. Yeah, yeah. And I'd already been through IF1, so. But that was my first personal loss, especially in the immediate platoon, especially your number one leader. Yeah. So uh, and I, they made a History Channel episode about it. And if you if you guys look, uh, maybe you can put it in the link. It's the uh, History Channel. It's called, um, I had it and I lost it. Um, it's called The War Fighters, The Ambush of April 7th. And that's a History Channel History Channel. <laughs> Uh, recount. I would have done it now, but when they asked me to speak about my side of the fight, I denied it. Just because my my, I was kind of sour about Generation Kill, to be honest with you, dude. I'm like, you guys just want really? fucking me. Yeah, they like in my head, I twisted it to you guys just want fucking money when you make money off of our fucking story. Go fuck yourself. Yeah. So I would I would do it now just to have that story told kind of like we're doing now. Um, I know what you're saying though. Like, Hey, especially when you're talking about a like actual Hollywood production company, like you guys are just going to dramatize this. This is for commercial value. Like you want to make sure that the purpose of it is to honor the guys, not make money off the guys, especially when you it, lose somebody. And they did. I watched half of it. If not all of it, dude, I got choked up, man. I'm not going to lie. I had a fucking couple, couple tears fucking fall, dude. Like, Hearing, and they shot this maybe 10 years ago, hearing uh, some of my boys that were there in the platoon, and especially up there next to Morel, speak and see how stoic and heartfelt and meaningful this, this day was to them and how they've lived their lives after. Mm -hmm. You know, I like to think, and I think this is like an individual thing, and I think we all think this is caregivers, so people and friends in our life, but I feel like I can take the world on my fucking shoulders, but seeing my boys go through similar trials and tribulations post-war in the States, like, I don't wish that on my boys, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, it drove it home just how more impactful that day was on the emotional side and the psyche side so but again we signed up for it dude he signed up for it to honor him as a fucking warrior 
we showed up, we showed up to the fucking fight, you know, and what some of us aren't coming home. That's the fucking reality of it, dude. He died literally charging the fucking hill. Like he jumped out of the vehicle as soon as the tick kicked off. And I think it was probably right after the explosion happened. Like he came from the grunts, dude. He was a cocky little fucker. And I did little, he was a big motherfucker, redhead too. And he didn't really want to be there. Like, he's like, dude, I'm not really a fan of recon. I was told to come here. It is what it is. I'm going to run it like this. I'm like, you're saying that to the wrong group of fucking dudes, man. But uh, I think my first 10 days there, I had no idea this happened. This is fucking badass. I'm so proud to say this story. This is because I, I flew in late. Like I said, that 10, 10 day hiatus that I had. I think you felt the vibe that the dudes were like fucking peacocking and like, you know, it's 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 smile for fucking male shit, dude. This is how it is. Yeah. He challenged he challenged every one of us at this one by one to a boxing match. By himself, no breaks. He went through every fucking dude. Wow. Full fucking strength. That's saying a lot. And he fought a, a platoon of twenty three motherfucker, twenty two. Twenty two recon one, guys too. Not even not your average yeah. dudes off the street. And some fucking scrappers, dude. Like. I did not know this until like the last two years. Uh, Eddie, I took the RPG to the arms. Like one of my favorite dudes. He told me this story, man. I, I forever since then, when I see pictures of him, like I wish I could drink a coffee, drink a beer with a guy. And now that I'm older, like just have that conversation of, of bros. But he did, he died valiantly, man. He fucking pushed the hill, charged the berm, smoked a dude or two with a fucking pistol, I think. Um, not being far, I think it was a pistol, missed a guy that was squatting to the left, single AK round above the sappy plate in the chest. Fuck. Didn't see him. He was taken on multiple at once, dude. I mean, fucking chest, he'd be proud, man. Like that, that's, that's some fucking alpha shit, dude. That's like it is shit. what it is. <clears throat> it is. Yeah, but man. He, he chose, chose that path, man. And I'm proud of him for protecting his guys and literally leading from the fucking front. So now, once the once once the politicians kind of stepped in and was like, "Hey, we're gonna pull back and let this kind of see if we can resolve this," you know, with the Iraqis or whatever. How active were you guys after that? What kind of missions were you guys doing? Because you guys weren't allowed back in the city, right? There was no one allowed in the city after that. No, no. So we left in October of '04, and they started it like November fifth, sixth, seventh, like three weeks after we fucking left. So, which I'm cool with. Um, it didn't really change, man. I mean, it was just busy well, the whole time, even after yeah, April. Yeah, dude, the whole fucking time, like the whole time, man. It didn't matter where we were at. That whole area was fucking hot. So, you know, it wasn't going house to house like it was in fucking Phantom Fury later. Mm -hmm. But I mean, did did you guys do any like actual like what people would think of like traditional reconnaissance missions, like setting up in hides and stuff like that. And yeah. get, can you, can you yeah. describe what that was like? Yeah. And maybe some like, uh, you know, yeah. Um, Oh yeah. It's a memorable event. Uh, we walked out of one of the gates, um, at the Met camp and walked across route mobile, we'll call it mobile or Michigan, <clears throat> the big highway, eight lanes, I think, or four, um, crossed a major fucking highway at night. And then got into the suspected area of these poo sites, point of origin, launch sites. These mortarmen were launching their version of fucking 60s and 120s out of the back, flatbed fucking basically like bigger like farm trucks. Mm -hmm. And they fucking smart, fucking smart. Launch, 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 gone. Like had it bolted down or whatever the fuck, got the azimuth at the distance to launch and they were the fuck out. So when our counter battery would pick up that point of origin from its signature and our radar, we'd instantly launch at that spot. They'd be gone by seconds, like missing it by 30 seconds of getting with their asses pushed in by this fucking barrage of Marine artillery. So smart on their part, man. For sure. Pretty cool. So part of that fucking anti mortarman mission we were going to go out, greenside patrol on foot, loaded to the fucking teeth. So we get out in this AO and you can probably find that on the map now, but there's a metric fuck ton of dogs, dude. And like, while we all were suppressed, like we smoked a bunch of fucking dogs because they would come up growling and making noise. 
Dude, we probably smoked 30 fucking dogs and we wanted to fucking rip us a new one, man, literally, and give our position away. So we smoked a lot of dogs, uh, crossed a couple canals at night over these shitty ass bridges, dude, that were flowing pretty rapidly, like pretty sketch the whole fucking way. And we were alone and unafraid, man. There were six fucking dudes on foot in their backyard. Mm -hmm. No Humvees, no support. Like, there's a QRF stood up, but they're on base, dude. Or maybe they were out doing, like, a satellite patrol, but quite the fuck a ways away. Mm -hmm. I think they were out there. I think they're on the base. That That's a little, that's beyond my scope, especially now. But, so there's not a lot of vegetation. There's no fucking mountains in that area, man. So it's, like, super suburban, like, random fucking houses and, and clusters of homes. And there's nowhere, it's like, sun's coming up, dude. We got, we got a fucking bed down somewhere. It's either dig a hole and Baptista or someone within my six man team's like, yo, let's get in this fucking creek. So there's like this canal with like green, perfect green, big, long, thick, uh, like, uh, like reeds is the word I'm trying to fucking say, like cattails, basically. We set up a whip antenna, which was fucking green. You couldn't fucking see it nice. feet away, man. So we're down literally in this up to our basically our waist in this like fucking shit canal because couldn't really on the berm as steep as it was but there was nowhere to fucking hide dude and there's green shit everywhere so it was the perfect spot who knows what the fuck we were laying in but it was our only option so we were in this fucking creek for like two days and at night it was fucking getting down to goddamn like in the 40s if not high 30s it was fucking freezing so i remember we got tired of the water like, fuck that, and moved out up over the fucking the ditch, just like the first three feet of uh, of, the, of, the, of the field right there, watching this fucking dirt road. And it was a pretty used road, so we're literally a recon team in the prone with our fucking rucks, laying on our rucks. When one man up, the rest were sleeping at night. And it was my watch in a motorman fucking vehicle, Black the fuck out, driving at night, no lights with a fucking tube in the back drives by, dude. Wake the motherfuckers up, man. We chose not to engage because we would have gave a position away. Radio it in. There were vehicles adjacent units they ended up getting that fucking vehicle, which is pretty dope. So we did exactly what we did. It was literally surveillance, reconnaissance, and called in and probably hopefully up the chain a command with our tech uh our uh proudness with fucking <clears throat> fucking cell phones and shit hopefully they ran up the fucking the whole echelon of that whole hierarchy of, of who's running that fucking cell mm -hmm. so morning comes uh we hear some movement to the left and to the right four of us stay two of us fucking peel off and get into a small engagement with one guy like on foot with an ak and they fucking smoke him so we get the fuck out we push to another fucking spot, spend the night again. And then another team that fucking next night ends up smoking some IED in placers. And they're like, dude, the whole area is fucking hot. We're pulling the fuck out. I'll never forget this, dude. So this is actually before. This is before Eddie. This is before April 7th, man. This is before. This wasn't long before this because I say this because Eddie had his arms at this point. Still one of the SOR missions that we did answer your question. Uh, so high back on B, right when the sun was coming up, still dark, they were picking our teams up. So they picked up the previous team, their stuff with 12 Marines in the back of this on B. I'm the last motherfucker to get in. All the rucks are kind of like we do on Zodiacs. All the rucks are in the middle. High back on B for you guys listening at this time, no armor. It was like a truck bed on B with a green tarp over the top, basically the cover. Two guys riding up front and there was like this wooden rails so all the boys had their guns outboard as we mo moved back you know extract got the fuck back to base and uh it was the last one through my big ass heavy fucking ruck up there it was like a bed to me i'm like i, I got nothing to do i'm just gonna lay here <laughs> laid on my fucking back and then the boys were quite a bit higher man and they had dudes facing there was not literally nothing for me to do mm -hmm. but just lay there it was a nice little break and we've been out for basically two days. I asked Eddie, he was to my direct right, and he was part of the team that smoked this other guy. And I'm like, elbowed him in the arm, and it's, it's fucking dark out. It's still, I'm like, hey, dude, like, what, what you guys do with that body? I'm like, 
He's like, you fucking serious? I'm like, yeah. He's like, you fucking laying on him. So so for like 30 minutes, I had no idea. I'm like, shut the fuck up, dude. the The other guy starts laughing and I'm like, no way. So I like red light fucking surefire. I'm like, and it's all rucks. And I'm like, I look down, I'm laying on a fucking poncho liner. And I'm like, I see like a little bit of a finger and I'm like, no fucking way, dude. I'm literally sitting on an enemy combatant's chest and head. Like my back was on his face, my ass, my ass was on this dude's chest, and it was super fucking cushy, bro. Like You're it was like, soft. Oh, that was a nice little spot. I thought. it was nice, and I did. I laid there for like thirty minutes, thinking about like pizza and women back in America, and oh, man. asking this fucking question. I peel this thing back, and it's his face, half of it's gone, and I'm just like. Well, that's one for a story on a podcast 20 years later. <laughs> but uh wow. Yeah, dude. That fucking happened, man. And, like that's those definitely... little that's those little moments that are great about like that come up on like podcasts because we could talk a little bit more in depth about stuff and it's like something yeah. like that is it's not so significant where it would be like on a history channel documentary or in a, a history book or something like that. But I'm sure obviously it stuck with you for two decades. Yeah, man, and I forget about it, obviously, dude, but that's just like one day, one mission, you know? And most of us fucking fought hard, multiple deployments after that, multiple agents after that. It's like one moment. You add them all up, dude. Like, I have a little aggression on the fucking road. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to, like, really listen to some chill music and, like, meditate and, like, find some fucking peace, all jokes aside, dude, because, yeah. like, if I let that barbaric me out, I'm going to be in prison, dude. And I want nothing to, and I'm going out of a hail of fucking bullets, dude. Cause I'm not going to prison. So. How, how many, how many deployments did you do over your career? Uh, between the CIA, the state department, MARSOC and recon fucking over 20 for sure. And I did a lot of fucking three month deployments, dude, for like four years. So a lot. I, I actually never counted. And I don't think there is a way to count actually, but definitely yeah. over 20. How do you, you know, someone that's gone through and done such a variety of things, and I'd like to, we'll schedule another podcast and get into some of the, you know, your future events with like the MARSOC and CIA and stuff like that. But after doing all that, how do you not go insane? How do you maintain your sanity? You know what I'm saying? After laying on bodies, after taking a knee in a puddle that used to be somebody's fucking body that was run over by a tank seeing your buddy you know his arms are blown off like how does that not permanently affect you it does permanently affect you but you have to honor it and check in with it and process it and thoughts will always come back you just like meditation let it in let it out so i don't drink a lot um i'm vocal obviously i'm talking to you now i i more importantly, I grew up the way I grew up. And I had a very loving family. And I wanted this adventure, so I can never get mad at my choices. And also, they shape who I am today. It was sure. super, super, super cliche. But it's fucking true, man. Um, this is an aspect of human beings. Like, dude, I've, I've told you, I, I did DMT. I've eaten a few mushrooms. Like, I've... I've gotten Joe Rogan on this experience and it's, it's fucking life, man. I think everyone's life is fucking crazy and it's relative to that individual, but it's not easy. No. And I, and I made it definitely not easier by joining this, this realm of fucking sword bearing fuckers to do like every other cultures warrior has done before them. And it was just my calling. It wasn't like I fucking obsessed about it. It wasn't like I, knew from a kid i hated fights bro Mm -hmm. as a kid so to answer your question man i think just you know i've been through quite a few relationships and i've sabotaged most of them you know i definitely came out of that realm uh i think i didn't realize i'll I'll just be blunt about this dude this was kind of like the catalyst um i've done pretty well the fucking to to uh, compartmentalize and deal with most of it, but it definitely manifested to those that were closest with me. And that's with a significant other. Um, And how that manifested in reality with that is 
in closing a lot of these relationships, especially the last four, um, said that like you got to learn how to love yourself. Mm. And not just once, but there was like a theme with that same same exact combination of words. I remember, dude, being a Garden Grove like two years ago, I Googled how to love yourself. Like, because I started to like, you know, denial, acceptance, like, you know, am I going to be a 40 plus year old dude by myself? Because I keep fucking, I want to be in a relationship, love women, beautiful, it's fun, I'm jovial, but when shit gets real, I'm not able to truly open up and in my head i think i am i think i'm being what i need to be to her and and share and listen and you know just be there emotionally but like i guess i haven't been so pulling myself back dude it's like i've had to really in the last four or five years at 43 now really fucking psychoanalyze like my behaviors and like how am i really dealing with this and how do i think i'm dealing with it because i think reality I'm doing good and, and shitty in, in both realms, high and low, but specifically with the human connection with others, there, there was a severe amount of mistrust in my human fellow humans. Uh, and I think I always wanted uh, relationships thinking they were going to end anyway, you know, mm, uh, yeah. which, which makes you kind of half ass relationship and going all in. Like it's going to be half ass if you don't jump blindly all in and make it like really count. So I think I was always like, that was my static line parachute reserve, you know, like, oh, fuck it. It's going to end anyway. So hmm. I've had recently, multiple, I've had multiple people tell me that, that they have a problem trusting regular people anymore. And it's not like, it's not like in the, in the sense that, I don't know, it's just, it's, they're just different, right? It's just not, you don't get it kind of deal. And like, how could I, I've talked before about it. It's like, how can I talk to you about an event that you can't even fathom? You have, you have no idea how to even understand the weight of the stuff we carried, the heat of the day, the sandiness of the air, the, the smell of the gunfire, you know, like how can, how could you understand if you can't even fathom what all that is like, you know? Right. And, And that's a tough thing for guys to get over. You know, it's a, I don't know. It's, um, I don't know. That's it though. That's people got to realize that, you know, you have to talk about And if you can't talk about it with regular people, you got to talk about with your fellow veteran, like reach out to the guys that you served with and stuff. I think, you know, like we talked about at the beginning of the podcast, you said that you were talking to Rudy Reyes at the uh, recon and uh, sniper foundation get together. What does an event like that do for your morale? you know, once you're out and that kind of brings you back in to see those people again. You know, it's, it's a family man. And at that point I realized it's more about the individual relationships and the individual humans that were there and not so much the green weenie. It's not so much the Marine Corps. Yeah. The Marine Corps was the catalyst brought us together, but it's the individuals and my individual relationship to each one of those guys and the collective that make it special. You know, and then, yeah, you feel that you're understood more, but to back it up a few sentences, man, um, if you go at relating to people like, you, like you'll never understand me, you don't know what I've been through, you're, cap- you're, you're limiting yourself already. Mm-hmm. Of course they fucking don't. And that, that's good. Like, I'm glad that we brought, we, we fucking wear this shit on our shoulders, like carrying it on our shoulders in our heads. Cause that means the fucking war was somewhere else, dude. Sometimes I think a war is needed here in America. So everyone gets, gets over the fucking Kardashians and like plastic surgery and their fucking iPhone 14 dash fucking 27, like in TikTok, right? Like we need a fucking awakening to some degree. I don't think it's war. Hopefully not, but the war is abroad. It's an adi- it's on a fucking other planet. You know, I'm glad because most people won't fucking handle that, you know, and it, it is the worst it's the worst thing. Man. Like we, 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 we can do so much together in unity. And here we are the millennia later after crawling out of the fucking caves, we're still bashing each other's heads in with rocks. So we're trivial fucking shit. So you have to understand that no one does understand that. Um, and most people mean well, and most people want to do good. And how do you have that conversation? man? like, I don't know. 
put it on yourself. Like, try to understand them. Fuck them understanding you. Like, this is real life. You do four years or 20 years or 30 years in your selected branch of service or a cop. Go volunteer in old folks home, dude. Go, like, go to the grocery store and, like, Costco and start helping old ladies to their fucking – do some good, man. Like, try to understand other fucking people and, like, try to get back to, like, center. Because all my boys that want to go fight in Ukraine, like, I get that fucking vibe, dude. I get I get the fucking break out the axe. I'm like, dude, but it's, like, that's that's a small part of my fucking life. And it's not real life. That is that is a moment, the worst day for two people. And that's not real life. Like, war, like this whole warrior tap to timmy tactical timmy mindset dude like i understand it but i don't understand at the same time man there is more in life about peace and fucking love in your small community and your fucking family and your friends because then it's the fuck over it's over quick dude i realized quickly well actually not i i, I learned later and recently in the last few years how truly life how short it is mm-hmm so I watched a fucking movie, dude. I'm not gonna lie about it. It choked me the fuck up. I watched it on Netflix a day ago, two days ago, coming back from Shot Show. And it's I think it's called Mission Joy. It's the Dalai Lama and the Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Two different fucking ideologies, two different religions, and they're like BFFs. It's the 14th Dalai Lama, man. And then the whole thing is about living with fucking joy. That's where I'm at now. Yeah. Like, like you have to find your fucking peace, whatever that is, whatever you're into, that happiness within, whatever the fuck that is for you as an individual and not what the Kardashians are doing. Like, find your happiness. If it's fucking working on old carburetors on a fucking GMC K5, if it's fucking, you want to be a teacher, if you want to fucking paint. I got into, I play the French horn. Like, nice. I fucking, classy. I was, a, I was a band geek, you know, and like, I want to get back into it. I play the piano, like, dude, I want my welding. I want to learn how to weld. I want to get my pilot's license. I want to get my captain's license. You know, Sounds like, like you want to live, man. Live. Truly live. And I've been half-assing it post-war a lot, man. And I've been there, dude. I've been super in my fucking head, you know? And then I'll come out of it one day. And I'm like, fucking cool again. You know, I it's think, like... I think part of the problem, too, is we want to do all these things. But then we kind of... We're hard on ourselves when we don't. And it's not realistic for you to be able to go and do 50 different projects, be an expert at all these different things that right. you want to learn about and stuff. So it's kind right. of a double-edged sword. You got to have to, you have to find a purpose yes. to give you a reason to get up and, you know, want to keep doing stuff and, and whatever. But at the same time, you have to be realistic and understand that you're not perfect. Setbacks are going to happen. Maybe you don't become the next, you know, leading French horn guy or whatever, you know, whatever. It's just... Yeah. So it, you're right, man. That's a great speech, bro. Like I, I thank you. You're right. Um, I'm the same way, cool. dude. I got 50,000 projects going on. I got the podcast. <laughs> I got two websites. I do photography and you know, like I, yeah. I do consulting for marketing, like I have a hundred yeah. things going on and I feel bad when I focus on one and some of the other, you know, the others start to kind of fall by the wayside a little bit. It's like, fuck, uh, you know, like yeah. I gotta be better. I'm better than this. You I know. try to, I do try to like prison fascinates me in the sense of I am trying to live currently like what if I was in prison or what were all the things I wanted to do while I was in Iraq and I couldn't, you know, I, I went home for Christmas for the first time in years. I saw my family and I'm like this distant uncle, you know, mm-hmm. my stepmom pulled me aside. She's like, it was so good. Like you made this Christmas whole for the first time in a long time. So my goal now is just to be a better, I'm like an uncle, I'm a father. It's kind of a touchy subject. I've got three kids in San Diego. Uh, I'll get into that at some other point. You know, I'm, I'm trying to get back in their lives because that's a giant void in my life. Yeah, for uh, sure. But be the best fucking father you can be. And like time is so fucking short, you know, and like it's so cliche to say that, man, but like it's hitting me now at 43 that I have less than half of my life left. God, if I'm, if that's I'm fucking, a horrible way to put it. But it is, it's a realistic. It's real way. though. It's real. So how do I make this? I don't want the Marine Corps, the CIA and the State Department, though fun that it's time, be the apex of my life. 
Like, that's the right next? attitude though. That's the right attitude. You know, keep well, pushing. What's the next, what's the next goal? What's the next mission? It no. genuinely, genuinely brings me happiness and happiness with others shared events. I want to laugh. I want to drink a fucking peanut butter stout with my boys and like fucking truly laugh and have joy. Watch that fucking watch that movie on Netflix, The Mission Joy. And dude, the Dalai Lama says it, I screenshot it while I was on the fucking the iPad, man. He's like, you, your happiness comes from within, whatever that is. Whatever that, whatever makes you happy and brings joy to others, because that's the true gift. Mm-hmm. This, is a fuck, this is a fucking TED talk. But like, I get more, you know, you know how this feels. And everyone listening, dude, like helping someone genuinely and not for the image or the picture. And like, really, you found a wallet. You, you go out of your way to fucking find the owner because their ID is in there. And then just give it back. And they try to give you money. Like, no, nah, man. Like, just do good in your fucking small little setting in your household and your block like if everyone fucking did that we have a pretty bitching existence man so yeah for sure i'm in that space now and through that sum all that shit up that's helping me get over everything that i saw overseas because that is a failure to communicate the highest fucking levels we were the fucking pawns that i signed up to be but that's not real life like the real life is here and you see trying every day trying every day to do fucking good a good friend of mine i met uh here's my head well he's actually in that picture man um that was the state department i was in the embassy he's up here uh it's an isis flag that's hanging in uh the u.s embassy in baghdad and he gave me this fucking saying do right fear no man like and i think about that shit a lot man like i'm just trying to fucking do right not fear anyone, obviously, uh, and just 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 make up for lost time. And I mean, I wouldn't change it. Maybe it got me to this fucking point now. But like I was saying, dude, just um, I'm at a point now where it's, you know, more of a meaningful life, and more, more umph. I'm putting more umph into things. Good man, you know? that's what guys need to be doing. You know, it's like. Uh maintain positivity and uh, get out there and just live. Like you said, the military, although awesome and amazing. And like, I was a JTAC, so I got to go out and like watch stuff blow up and you know, like that was crazy. Right. But is that it? Do I just spend the rest of my time reminiscing about those, you know, years that I got to do that? Or do I reminisce about those while I'm doing also cool shit again, you know, like continuing to new cool shit, you know? So yeah, I like the positivity, man. I think it's great. Um, where can people find you, dude? Do you have like a, your own website and all that stuff or what? Yeah. Uh, so like yourself, I run a YouTube channel and a podcast and I'm with another gentleman. Uh, he's my co-host and business partner, Patrick Moultrie. He's an 18 Delta medic with the Navy SWIC teams in SW. It was a prior 331 Marine. We started Savage Actual. Um, on YouTube to Savage Actual and uh, our Instagram is uh, savage.actual um, my personal Instagram is Jason underscore Lizzle L-I-Z-Z-L-E I don't know why I picked that but I did so I got it and uh, <laughs> yeah reach out you know I know we're like halfway through it we're not talking about the agency and State Department Marsoc yet but yeah I mean I've met a lot of fucking cool people from abroad Russians to a Frenchman to now we've got a lot of fans that have reached out, man. And it's, it's, there's an amazing community of people that I'm really trying to surround myself with and pick the right ones, man. The toxic fuckers are getting the fuck out, you know, and I hope you get over the toxicity so we can circle back later on, but you got to get over your funk and fucking own it. So piggybacking real quick back on what you just said, your experience as a JCAC as a Marine, my experience, like, Truly, guys, like, and gals, like, you don't want to be that dude at the fucking VFW wearing a fucking corporal red marine hat talking about being in line at supply. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's got to be fucking more than your four years. When you were a fucking teen in early 20s, do you want to live like that? Like, do those years of your little brain that's just post-testicles dropping in high school, like, do you want to live in that mind space? Like... Fuck no. Like 24 year old me was 
not like the coolest person, you know, I'm definitely not very responsible in my personal life. You yeah, know, yeah. I was at the bar all the fucking time. So there's got to be a progression. Still honor yourself and your likes and dislikes, but you got to grow as a person and let that be a fucking amazing chapter. But it's a short chapter if you're living fucking 90 years. Mm-hmm. That's four years of your 90 years, bro. Is that there's an identity issue with, with veterans? You know, like I'm fucking Jason Lilly. I'm a fucking Raider. I'm a recon Raid. Like that is not me, though. Like that, that, that's a job. And it was a huge part of my life as being a JTAC. But that does not define Justin Kramer. That doesn't define Jason Lilly. No. It, as your mistakes don't define you, dude. Like that's a short time. What define you is how you are to fucking people. Yeah, man. Uh, but, no, I agree. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree. And I, people got to find an outlet. I think what really helped me was picking up a camera a couple years before I got out. I hadn't done photography in years. And I was like, I was really getting into the Southern California car scene. And I was like, I'm going to get a camera and start shooting photos again, man. And I started going out probably <clears throat> two to three times a week, almost to car meets anywhere from long beach down all the way into San Diego. You know, oh, I had yeah, an man. Evo, I had a Mitsubishi Evo and stuff. So I was rolling my, up and it was, like, yeah, it was a good time. And it was like just becoming expressive with my photography and like being able to kind of, I don't know, let people see my perspective, not in just on the world, you know, not that doesn't have anything to do with the military. That's just on in the world in general, just, you know, um, and then the, obviously the podcast has been a great outlet. It's obviously allows me to one, like maintain like one foot in the military world where I can kind of keep up with things that are going on and, and learn more about what guys have done and stuff like that. But you know, it's not, I don't know. It's I, I'm not like, I'm not doing it to, cause I can't let it go. You know, I was a military kid growing up and I always just loved the military. I would watch all the yeah. movies. I read all the books. So this is like a natural thing for me. This is like a good passion for me to fall right. into because it's almost becomes like a, you know, I it sounds douchey to say, but like a, almost a historian, like doc, documentarian, you know, yeah. having the honor of like recording all these conversations and stories like your own and stuff like that. Yes. So that's kind of my passion. And that's just what guys got to do, man. They got to find something. It doesn't have to be military related at all. It could be whatever, but find a passion, you know? So. Dude, I a hundred percent agree with you, dude. I mean, you're talking to a fellow photographer as well. That's rad. I'm a Canon guy. I won't judge if you're not, but, uh, <laughs> <An icon. laughs> yeah, my stepdad is too, man. Uh, that's funny. You know, we both share outside of the Marines. I'm in San Diego. I was for San Diego 20 years. I, I've been surfing all the reefs in La Jolla. And I've surfed about every breach and California, to be honest with you, dude. So that gave me more passion than a lot of things I did in the military, to be honest with you, dude. Surfing so. is fucking scary shit, dude. I'm, uh, <laughs> I've got this board up here. I don't think I've ever actually talked about it. My, my old neighbor, when I first got out of the Marines, I lived right off base and I was like a five minute walk from the pier in Oceanside. Sure. And, um, my old neighbor was a local and he'd been surfing his whole life. And he came over to my house and saw a photo I had on the wall. I actually have it up there of the pier. You know, it's a, it's like almost probably almost six feet long. And he's like, Hey man, can I get a copy of that? I'll trade you a surfboard for it and then take you out. And I'm like, all right, cool, man. You know? And, um, that's how I ended up with that board. It's actually a little short for me. He's a shorter guy, but dude, I remember going out a couple times and he's a good surfer cause he's been doing it his whole life. And he took me out on a couple times where I probably should have been out there and just seeing like a giant swell coming towards me being like, what the fuck am I doing out here? You know? So it's yeah, one of those yeah. things like, um, it's great. It's, uh, if you want to, if you want a thrill, I'd say for people to give it a try. I mean, it was one of those things like I'm in Southern California. How could I not at least try it? You know what I'm saying? It's like, you have to, you live here. How can you not at least go out and try surfing? You know, I'd yeah, like to man, get out and it, do it some more this summer, but just, just do it. And it's through repetition. So cliche through repetition, it all starts to fucking come to center, man. It's yeah. so disconnected. It's so discombobulated, but dude, it took me years to finally fucking launch off the lip and do a, my first like fucking real trick. Like, you know, like it, it, it fucking, that was my jam for a long time, dude. But like that analogy with anything, just, just stick with it, man. It, it's, we're kind of fucked up in the head a little bit with the Marine Corps, man. That's going to come quick and easy, but surfing is not, there's too many variables, man. It's a three dimensional environment. I challenge you to stick with it to go weekly, like shitty days, good days. Just keep 
keep being in the fucking environment, man. And you'll There's some legit out. dudes out here. There's some legit surfers. This is like, <laughs> yeah. it's awesome. And that's one of the things I used to go out and shoot photos of all the time. I'd, you know, right. hop, hop rocks out on a jetty and sit out there where the break is and shoot photos of the surfers and stuff. It was always a good thing. Yeah, For people that are in Southern California, actually near Camp Pendleton, there is a Camp Pendleton surf club that is a bunch of like veterans and it's a bunch of, I think there's active duty guys and stuff and they meet on base at Del Mar. And Del so Mar. I would reach, yeah. I would tell people of any kind of skill level to reach out to those guys. Cause they'll even teach you, they'll bring you out there and bring out some long boards and teach you how to do it and everything. So that's a really good opportunity that people ought to check out. Um, outside of that, man, everybody could check out my stuff. J Kramer graphics.com. My uh, Instagram is at former action guys and at former action news. And that's it, dude. I really appreciate it, man. Oh yeah. Thanks for having me here, man. For sure.